so uh, good evening doctors i uh, hope it is on live now so i am dr stalin on behalf of uh, shield with health care i am welcoming you all for the uh, today's uh, webinar and uh, it's uh, as you all know that our ku update, update series is happening uh, in a very uh, extensive and very uh, knowledgeable manner and many many doctors are making this uh, useful finding it useful and now it's time to uh, introduce our coordinator for the day uh, chitra can you run the slides uh, so i would like to introduce our convener dr priyanku rai sir uh, sir is currently the consultant infertility and uh, gyne endoscopy nova ivf and royce clinic uh, siliguri uh, sir is the india representative at wtog uh, figo 2018 21 and the national coordinator perinatology committee foxy E zone coordinator infertility and endocrinology committee foxy and uh, sir has published more than 60 articles in national and international journals and authored 15 chapters and and sir is also a peer reviewer of various journals presented uh, more than 50 articles in uh, various conferences uh, sir has uh, received many awards to his, his credit sir has received the gold medal for topping in ms university examination and uh, sir has received dr uh, nimisha ashalet research award uh, recently in 2020 so with this introduction i welcome you sir and uh, now it's time to introduce uh, our dr uh, diksha gausami sharma ma'am madam is currently the director of pushpanjali ivf and uh, fnb madam has completed M- md dnb and fnb in reproductive medicine madam is the uh, north zone coordinator perinatology committee foxy Uh, librarian up isar madam has received the runner up award for uh, up shanti yadav award in infertility aicog 201 that is i think it's 2000 something so madam has received the uh, winner best paper first women's international health summit 2018 so madam has also received the winner in overall best girl trophy in uh, mbbs madam has published Uh, um, as, uh madam is also a co editor in foxy focus on infertility 2018 and madam has also uh, published various uh, journals in uh, international journals and uh, authored chapters in various uh, books uh, so <laughs> madam special interest is pcos and reproductive endocrinology uh, madam on on uh, behalf of shield i welcome you also ma'am thank you so very much so good evening everyone it gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you today to this ku knowledge update web series the seventh episode of it it's been a wonderful program and we have had excellent sessions in the last six episodes where we enjoyed it thoroughly and are the increase in the number of delegates tell us that the delegates are also uh, also enjoying it uh, the uh, session after session so today we have another exciting session we have exciting faculties we have uh, guest of honor chief guest as well as special guests who are very very near and uh, near and dear to our hearts and also very encouraging people so first of all to welcome everyone on this platform i would like to uh, introduce dr pratibha singh ma'am who is a convener of this program she is uh, uh, she is uh, a consultant in bhagalpur she is a consultant in laparoscopic and A- art specialist past state honorary secretary general of the association of the gynecology societies of bihar and jharkhand she is the founder secretary of the sovsi that is the society of vaginal surgeons of india founder secretary of the bhagalpur menopause society vice president of the bhagalpur obgyn society vice president of the bhagalpur menopause society and currently she has been appointed as the e zone coordinator of the international academic exchange committee it gives me immense pleasure to welcome ma'am to this platform for and requesting you to kindly welcome our faculties as well as our delegates thank you dr priyankur so good evening and warm welcome to all of you to this ku web series and we are really passing through a very difficult times and i think this is the worst phase of our life corona has spared no one and all are getting infected our colleagues our uh, junior seniors everybody is infected our Uh, uh all of our uh, near and dear ones they are few of them are critical and few have lost their battle and we are really helpless and i can just pray to god and hope that everything comes back to normal 
but till then we have to behave responsibly as we not only have to take care of ourselves our families but also our patients too so be sensible and take all precautions while treating your patients and i think soon this time will also pass and it is said that adversity is one of the best teacher to the person who accepts challenges and turns into new opportunities so this knowledge imparting webinars which are going on all over is helping us to improve and revise our academic skills and i think that is the best thing which is happening nowadays so once again we are here with our seven series of knowledge update and before i start let me welcome our chief guest a very elegant full of life cheerful past president foxy dr hema divakar ma'am she is one of those who have taken a step forward in providing quality maternal care foxy initiative manyata is her brain child where they are providing training to the healthcare workers so that they are able to deliver safe and respectful care to mother and newborn and i'm sure many of you know that this is foxy project which is going pan on pan india and providing trainings to make our paramedics and giving accreditation to many hospitals which is really a great step forward in reducing maternal mortality rate in india and improving healthcare facilities in a, in this segment so i am really very happy ma'am that you have accepted our invitation and i welcome you to this forum our guest of honor is again a very dynamic a very committed foxian dr basu mukherjee who is vice president vice president foxy elect for the year 21 22 so i would like to welcome you to this ku web series Thank and you. our special guest is again a very prominent personality dr abha singh ma'am chairperson medical education committee so welcome ma'am to this forum now it is my great honor and privilege to welcome our own dr pc mahapatra sir who is past president foxy the teacher of teachers and it is always a pleasure and knowledge worthy to listen to his academic deliberations and in spite of being so busy he has always uh, accepted our invitation and today i'm so glad and feeling really happy to welcome you sir on this platform i think he'll be joining shortly and uh, sir please uh, keep blessing us always and uh, i'm also want to have, welcome all our chair persons and judges dr gopinath sir from kananur dr nishi roshni from trishur dr raghavend prasad from kasargod and dr fasi luis from cochin now finally our debaters dr archana kumari and dr nitin shah welcome to this forum and let's witness a mind boggling debate today last but not the least i would like to welcome our dynamic conveners dr priyanku roy and dr diksha goswami and now i hand over the session to them for further proceeding so once again welcome to all thank you so much thank you so much uh, pratibha ma'am so now it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our chief guest uh, dr hema divakar can i have ma'am cv please so ma'am is a past president of foxy can you first give the answer for the previous surprise quiz yes ma'am i will yeah. okay so uh, let us uh, so we know that ku series is is gaining its popularity because of the quizzes that we we have that we conduct so we have a we have a surprise quiz at the end of every session so the so the quiz that we had last time was which of the following is the greatest single cause of infertility affecting more than equal to 35% of couples and the correct answer of course we uh, we will have our uh, differences in opinions but the correct answer this was a session that was uh, the the chief the speaker was dr priya dr bnc dr bidena chakravarty sir and our chief guest was dr kamini rao ma'am so the answer from both of them they uh, unanimously opted for sperm disorders so we have taken that as the answer though there were quite a few of them who said tubal dysfunction or pelvic lesions could be something that we could also think of we had a total of uh, can we move to the next slide please we had a total of two correct answers uh, for this so i would like to congratulate the winners uh, for that so we had said we will be giving two books uh, books by dr vn chakravarty three editions of it volume 1 volume 2 and volume 3 since we have only two winners for this quiz so we will be giving the prize to both these winners that is dr vandana shah from chennai congratulations on winning the surprise quiz uh, prize 
the certificate is signed by Dr. B. N. Chakravarti sir as well. And our second prize winner is Dr. Amita Mangal from Agra. So congratulations, Dr. Amita, and congratulations to Dr. Vandana for winning the prize. So um, thank you so much. Uh, so now can I have the CV of Dr. Hema Divakar, ma'am, please? Yes. So it gives me immense pleasure now to welcome none other than Dr. Hema Divakar, ma'am. She is uh, a living legend. Everyone respects her and everyone uh, like sort of wants her to be present in the sessions because she makes sessions very lively. And the way she talks, the way she interacts brings a lot of energy to into whatever session she goes into. She's a past president of Foxy, vice chair of FIGO PCP NDT committee from 2015 till date, an opinion leader. Uh, of course she is, and she has this initiative of artists for her, which is an excellent initiative. And we always, always do remember, ma'am, for the excellent AICOG 2018 that we thoroughly enjoyed in Bangalore. So welcome, ma'am, to this platform. I would request a few words of blessings from you, please. Namaskar. Thank you, Priyankur. As uh, Pratibhaji started right at the beginning, saying that the situation all around us is dismal, and we have to but start with the prayers to the Almighty to do the best for us to overcome this hurdle of the pandemic. Pandemic. So in the same way, I would say that KU is the knowledge update. But may I also, at the same breath, pray that God gives us the wisdom to be spiced over the knowledge that we have so that we do the right things at the right time. And Basa this year, he was one of my leading champions during my year of residency in 2013, when we had a series of programs called the KEY programs, K-E-Y. It's a K-E-Y, it's keep educating yourself. And that's what we all are up to all the time. And really the shield has shielded us with that protective power enabling us to move ahead despite whatever else is happening around us, bringing us together in this, you know, kind of a hostile environment to give us some spark to exchange some ideas and experiences to continue to do our best. Well, what else can be in this pandemic? Uncertainties, questions, and more questions. Should we give the vaccine to the pregnant and lactating women? Maybe yes, maybe no. We have, we don't have the data. We don't know what to do, etc., etc. Should we have a nationwide uh, lockdown? As Fauci just now, 20 minutes back, he announced India, the whole of India should lock down. Should we? Should we not? Are we doing that or are we not doing it? So this is an era of questions and uncertainty. Rightly so. Pratibhaji and her whole team has brought in more questions about the same old problem of the myomas. To treat or not to treat the myomas. That is the first part which is going to be deliberated. And then, just at the moment I say this, the maha of the mahatmas of the great nation of India, PC Mahapatra has just arrived. <laughs> Namaste PC and it always gives us such a, you know, broad umbrella of some kind of a courage when PC is there. Because he is one of the wise men who is very mature in his decisions. And this kind of mature decisions, dear friends, are needed when you're faced with <coughs> situations of myoma, to be or not to be, to treat or not to treat. And... Who other could have been your the better, the best choice except Mahapatra? So on behalf of hey all ma, of you, hey ma, hey ma. <laughs> I know that you will really, really enjoy this session because you've got the, when I said the right decisions at the right time, you've also got the right person at the right time. So welcome Maha on my own behalf also. The second segment, okay, now you have decided to treat. Again, the questions are asked, medical or surgical? And the same topic, definitely the legends will remember that decade after decade after decade, the answers are different. It is just like reading the same book over and over again 
and you start gathering more and more insights and more information and better understanding of the whole issue. Similarly, the COVID pandemic may be new, but myoma is not new. It has been with us since ages. Everybody in our practice, no matter which generation, whether it is the Sonawala generation or Mahapatra generation or Priyanku generation, the myoma has stayed with us, but the thought processes of what to do, what not to do has changed. So the, the topics are really apt. The debates are much needed. We have to agree to disagree. And we have to, again, individualize and see what best we can do. So may I wish on behalf of very distinguished and accomplished faculty that you have put together today, that you will have a very great learning experience and you will recall the memories of what you have learned this fine evening and let the best benefit reach all your patients. Thank you for making me a part of this delightful session on the myomas. Namaste. Thank, Thank you, you uh, so very much, ma'am. It's indeed a pleasure to listening to you. And ma'am, we would request you to kindly stay on for another uh, 10 minutes or so. We'll be having the prizes for uh, the Know Your Legend quiz and we'll, we would request you to felicitate our winners. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and uh, next, I would like to introduce a guest of honor. But before I do that, of course, uh, uh, regards and pranam to Pisi Mahapatra sir, a teacher of teachers whom we totally respect uh, throughout. So now Thank I would you, like sir. to Welcome. introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Basab Mukherjee sir. Uh, so he is a vice president elect of Foxy, organizing secretary of EICOG 2022, which we are going to host in Kolkata. FIGO coordinator, South Asia Safe Abortion Committee member of ICOG Governing Council from 2015 to 20, and was the honorary secretary of Bengal OBGYN Society. In, the, in that year, we had Bengal OBGYN Society had done really wonders. So it gives me immense pleasure to welcome uh, Basabda to this platform and request a few words of uh, wisdom from you, Basabda. Thank you, um, Priyankur. Uh, words of wisdom um, cannot be I'm humbled for being here with Dr. Hema and uh, Dr. P.C. Mahapatra here, two of my mentors in Foxy, two people who we, um, of course, look up to along with everybody else here. And this is a, a wonderful experience being here. I congratulate Dr. Pratibha being the program director and you, Diksha and Priyankur being the program conveners of this series. As was mentioned, it is difficult to focus on academics amidst the entire gamut of the pandemic moving all around us. But at the same time, being an academic body, it is important from time to time to get distracted and to try to be what we do best is to look at academia and to look at some amount of discussion on different uh, topics. So myoma is something which you can have a three day conference on, but putting a myoma, just the controversies and the dilemmas and just putting one or two questions makes it so much interesting because that's where the discussion lies. And that's what Dr. Hema was saying. It's the same page, but it keeps on changing. Every decade you have the, the same question, but different answers and the evidence keeps on and experience keeps on uh, piling up. And who better to involve in this rather than Dr. P.C. Mahapatra, uh, the teacher of teachers, as Priyankur has mentioned, and he is a uh, a uh, gem of person and he will uh, be uh, his experience what he will share and what he will speak will of course benefit all the attendees who are here in this program so thank you very much for um, uh, for having me i congratulate uh, all the organizers and the faculty and um, uh, look forward to a very nice learning experience thank you priyankul thank, thank you dr thank pratibha you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you uh, basada for your words thank you so very much uh, so next, next we move on to introducing our special guest. Vasad, I request you to kindly stay on for another five minutes. We'll have the prizes and I would request you to felicitate them. Thank you. So uh, next we have a special guest, Dr. Abha Singh Ma'am. She is a director, professor and unit head at the Lady Hardings Medical College and SSK Hospital in New Delhi. She has been a past president of the prestigious AOGD, past president of NACHI. She is currently the chairperson of the Medical Education Committee uh, from till 2021. And under her, her I guess, under the aegis of the committee, she has done a number of uh, uh, or a number of um, prestigious orations at the, the AICOG conferences. So I welcome ma'am to this platform and request a few words of blessings from you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Priyanka, for this nice work. Uh, I'll uh, first of all, I like to 
congratulate Dr. Pratibha for the, her endeavor to find out time and uh, the sense of uh, the, because in this pandemic, everybody is too anxious, too concerned. Nobody can concentrate because everybody has lost some near dear people around. And this phase of uh, um, pandemic, I think, will pass off another uh, one month. It will go down. 15 days, we expect the peak to be there in 15 days. And after that, it will come down. So everybody has to take precaution. Everybody has to keep the health uh, and uh, keep themselves safe. So this is what I want to tell you. And uh, this is um, uh, organizing webinars and participating in these uh, webinars is a way of distracting yourself from this pandemic. And I know that it is really difficult, but still uh, whoever tries to join will be distracted for at least some time. And this topic, again, it is not new, but yes, everybody says that the answers are uh, again and again, answers may change according to the uh, time. And I like to, uh, and, uh, Dr. P.C. Mahapatra, he is one of the best teachers who can really uh, deliberate on this topic because uh, sometimes you say fibroid, okay, you may remove the fibroid. Sometimes you say, okay, medical management is okay. Sometimes you operate the fibroid and again the fibroid comes in. So all these problems persist. Whether you want to do a surgery before the, uh, if the patient is having infertility, whether you want to remove the fibroid earlier or later on. And the same thing is when the, you are uh, doing a say, cesarean section, do you want to remove the myoma? So all these questions, they are not, uh, questions are not new, but yes, every, as everybody said, the answers go on changing with the changing scenario. So I like to congratulate Dr. Pratibha and I like to thank uh, Dr., Dr. Hema, Dr. Basab, who have also joined here and Dr. Priyankur, uh, who's the uh, coordinator here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Abha ma'am, for uh, those wonderful words. So now it's time to uh, come to the answer of the Know the Legend quiz. This is. Let me just tell you a little bit of background. This quiz has been very exciting because the question is put in the various WhatsApp group and the answers come so very quickly that uh, even, you know, there were, this time also uh, we had total of 109 entries. Out of them, only 11 were wrong and 98 were correct. And uh, honest oh. confession, out of the seven quizzes that has happened till now, I could uh, I knew the person only once. That was Dr. Subhash, Subhash Mukherjee. That is the last time. And this time, I had no idea of who the win who the person was. But of course, it's Dr. William Francis Victor Bonney, uh, a British gynecologist famous for the Bonney's blue <laughs> antiseptic. <laughs> Mastering Vertime cystectomy, myomectomy, ovarian cystectomy, as well as a clamp that we use very still very recently, and even maybe some of us are still using it. So now let me just announce the names of the winners. Congratulations to all the winners. The first prize goes to my very good friend, Dr. Shaila Jamal from Bareilly. She wins a certificate. Uh, she wins a certificate as well as a book, the Tillandes Operative uh, Gynecology, which is a book that stays in the in the in the cupboard of most of the gynecologists because it's a the must book that we should have. And this certificate is signed by Hema Ma'am, Basabda, as well as uh, Dr. Abba Singh. So congratulations, Shela, on your feet. Uh, next, for the second prize, we have Dr. Arun Pandit from Gujarat, from either Gujarat. She has, uh, he has won a handbook of obstetrics and gynecological emergencies, another wonderful book to have in your shelf. And again, the certificate is signed by Dr. Hema Ma'am, Dr. Basabda, as well as Dr. Ava Ma'am. So congratulations, Dr. Arun. And the third prize, we had a tie. We have two people who have won the third prize. The first of, of them are Dr. Neha Gupta from Noida. So congratulations, Dr. Neha. She also wins the Lippincott Manual, the John Hopkins Manual of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Mm -hmm. And along with her, we also have Dr. Supriya Jaiswal from Patna, who, have, who has won this prize. So she also gets uh, this uh, certificate as well as a book. So congratulations to all four of you. Now I would request Hema Ma'am to kindly felicitate the winners of, uh, of the quiz. I think the variety of uh, uh, presentations to which the Foxians have to respond has really blown up in the recent past with all kinds of 
healthy competitive events which gives us you know much more out of the box thinking and compels us to really dig deeper into the past present and the future so congratulations once again and i think all the winners you know is a very special congratulations but all the participants as well yes. we have to congratulate them because to win you have to begin so unless you participate there is no chance that you have to go to ahead so um, 110 is a good score but i'm sure that this will catch up like my fire because it is entertainment it is education and infotainment or entertainment as the new terminologies are emerging so once again heartfelt congratulations to all the winners in the series 1 and 2 which uh, priyankar said and uh, i've had the good fortune of meeting dr jamal again and again um, being exposed to her multifaceted Mm, uh, personality with a uh, lot of assets that she has and uh, diksha it's the first time i think i've seen you on the virtual platform so more power to the youth leaders of tomorrow and i think all of us from esther years will agree that as nadita had declared in her team smarter stronger and will make the world safer so with heartfelt good wishes to all of you and on a virtual platform priyanka should let me know what i have to do in order to felicitate them because they have been exchange of hats the transfer of dias and all kinds of things that the new era generation have been doing and making us do as well and we have complied with all your requests so <laughs> pratima ji and priyanka if you let me know except a very hearty congratulations and lots of you know the more accomplishments and best wishes for the future if you need me to do anything else here here felicity <laughs> thank you so very much ma'am your your words of felicitation i'm sure is is good enough for all the winners and for all of us especially youngsters so thank you so much uh, for that ma'am so uh, abadidi and uh, basab who have also signed with um, um, uh, pratima and rajurkar uh, okay so uh, the certificate goes on behalf of all of us so all happy of us. Yes, we have we have more few more few more appreciation prizes yeah yes. so this set yes. also comes with the awesome Five <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Emma, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, can I have the rest of the certificates, please? So now I would like to uh, congratulate the winners of the consistent winners. These are the people who have answered most of the quizzes correctly, and that too in a very short uh, time. So, congratulations to the winners. I would first of all like to uh, announce the name of the first uh, prize winner of this. That is Dr. Suman Bishnoi from Gurgaon. She uh, congratulations, Dr. Suman. You also get a book of word round in obstetrics and gynecology by Dr. Sunanda Kulkarni and Dr. K. Srinivas. So, congratulations, Dr. Suman. We also have other consistent prize winners, Dr. Koshik Dasta Pramanik from Kolkata. Congratulations, Dr. Koshik. Now we have Dr. Anita Anita Rajoria from New Delhi, New Delhi as well, who have participated and won the prize. This gives us a lot of enthusiasm because we see youngsters. Along with that, we see also people. uh expert faculties seniors who are also participating so that is really encouraging congratulations anita ma'am then we have another prize winner dr leena lal from hagalpur congratulations dr leena we also have dr abharani sina ma'am who is again a senior faculty from patna who has won uh, the consistent uh, winner prize then we have dr surekha saide from wardha she is also another senior faculty doing another icog program today but she is also a winner of this consistent prize uh, winner so i congratulate all six of you and request basabda to kindly uh, congratulate them and felicitate them yeah so uh, on on behalf of the organizing team i congratulate the winners i think one of the challenges in when we do a virtual program is connecting with our audience and uh, sometimes you like to do it just by your voice and by your slides and by the knowledge you impart but sometimes you don't really know on the other side whether people are listening to you or whether really they are interacting so different ways of doing that one is the polls which are the polls which you do immediately on the site when you get the response from the audience how many people actually are responding to you one is by doing quizzes 
where immediately you have an idea about this fastest finger first, how many people are really in, on, in tune with you. You see 600 registrations, but you see 100 responses. You know, at least 100 people are in sync. And this is reaching out to people who are actively on the screen, really wanting to wait and listen to every word, catch on to every pearl of wisdom which is being imparted there. So I think it's important because this is a new sort of a medium. Over the last one year, we have got used to the virtual media. And it's important to reach out the challenge of connecting to the person on the other side. Speaking on a screen seems once upon a time seemed madness. But that seems to be the norm which we need to carry on for most of this year. And I think this quiz is a wonderful idea in which you're connecting with people and the response which you're getting and the appreciation which you're giving to people once they're with the response is something which is really worth it. I also like to appreciate the idea of giving books. It's a really wonderful idea. We have that from time to time, giving books, but giving a, on a virtual quiz, uh, appreciating the winners, giving these books out, uh, and a wonderful collection of books, I must admit, Priyanku, I love to have some of them myself. And a wonderful, so that's a really a good uh, way of reaching out and interacting with your audience and connecting with them and making them involved in the entire program. Congratulations again so to Pratibha, you and Diksha. It's a really well effort and uh, all the best to Knowledge Update series. May more series continue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Basadda. Probably another advantage of being on the virtual platform. Once you're finished, done with your work and you want to go home quickly, you can quickly change probably in between your sessions and be ready to go home as soon as you're done. So, Basadda, thank you so much for waiting on and uh, thank you for that. So now I would like to uh, give others uh, a few certificate of appreciation more, which are for the fastest finger first, the winners of this quiz alone. So it's Dr. Vinita Avasti from Kanpur. We also have Dr. Dipali Mittal from Indore, who has bagged another prize. Dr. Preni Shah from Mumbai. Congratulations, Dr. Preni. Dr. Anupama from Muzaffarpur. So congratulations to Dr. Anupama. Okay, we have Dr. Prasanna Menon from US, who has answered this uh, right from there. And it's, it's a matter of, indeed, I must appreciate, because the thing is, it's a difference of almost 12 hours, and the answer came quickly. That means that at the, even in this order uh, from US, you are there seeing the question and answering quickly. So congratulations, Dr. Prasanna. Dr. Bandita Sina from Navi Mumbai, Dr. Nalini Sharma from Udaipur, Dr. Indu Singh from Hagalpur, Dr. Pankuri Goel from Jaipur, Dr. Savita Tyagi from Agra. So congratulations to all of you. A few uh, uh, words of felicitation from Abha Singh, would, I'm very sure, will be very encouraging for our winners. So Abha, a few words from you, please. Okay. Uh, it, uh, congratulations, all the winners. And uh, it is re really a very nice initiative uh, to involve uh, so many people from all over India and even from abroad, from USA, somebody has participated, Dr. Prasanna. So it is very nice that people the, during these virtual webinars, people can participate from all over the country. And the knowledge which is being dissipated to all over India will be uh, highly appreciated. So uh, the, it, it is really very nice initiative from your side also to have so many prizes and encourage people to participate uh, in these webinars. You rightly said that uh, you see that 600 people have logged in, but uh, once you are uh, having these quiz, more people will participate and more people will be attentive during these webinars. They will not just open and roam around or be present in two, three webinars at one uh, stretch of time. So this is a really nice initiative to involve so many people in these webinars. And so they are alert and uh, they are uh, participating in the quiz also. So congratulations, all, uh, all the uh, participants who have won the prize and all those who have participated may not have been won the prize this time, but may it will be a, a route that they can win the prizes in the later stages. So thank you, Dr. Pratibha for organizing this quiz also during the webinars. Thank you so very much, Avama. So are you really, uh, it's really appreciative uh, the, the half an hour that you spend with us, Hema ma'am, Basadda and uh, Avama. Thank you so much for being us, uh, with us today. It really means a lot to us, ma'am. Thank you so much. So thank now, you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. So as a, uh, as a routine that we usually do, the winner of the Know Your Legend quiz, 
participates in the program and talks a little bit about the legend. So we have with us today Dr. Shaila Jamal, who won the first prize for the Know Your Legend quiz, who will be presenting her uh, her uh, short uh, the short discussion about the legend. So Shaila, I request you to share your screen. So Shaila Jamal is the North Zone Coordinator of the YCP Committee, Foxy. She is doing excellent work. She is the president of the um, of the SDHMM, if I am uh, correct. And Shella, now I request you to kindly share your screen, enlighten our uh, viewers about the legend series. Thank you so much, Priyanku. Thank you so much, Hima ma'am, Basab sir, and Abha ma'am. And thank you so much, Pratibha ma'am, for uh, having this wonderful concept around. So I'm allowed to share my screen. I'm putting my video on off. Please do, Shella. Thank you. <clears throat> so Priyanka, please let me know audio visibility everything that yeah, mandatory. Yeah, we can, see, we yeah, can yeah. see your slide and we can hear you clearly, Shela. You can go on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So identify the legend. Uh, here is the picture. So we all know the legend. We need to know a bit more about him. So to know more about him, we have to venture into the era where surgeries were evolving each day, each minute, and each second. That was the time when obstetricians were not considered to be of any specific super or sub-speciality. But we saw an obstetrician who operated thousands of wounded soldiers outside his realm throughout the First World War. He did many procedures on them, including extracting bullets and shrapnels, and healed them, actually. He was described as a primary influence on the world gynecology in the years between the wars. In the era when obstetricians were not even allowed to open abdomen, he invented this operation, myomectomy. He who performed around 700 myomectomies way back in 1930. To him, we owe reduced blood loss, reduced hematoma formations, reduced incidences of real laparotomies, and obviously lesser hysterectomies. In 1913, when none of us could actually imagine performing a crucial surgery like this, he made it very, very clear that he strenuously advocated myomectomy in preference to hysterectomy in all those cases in which the removal of uterus is liable to be followed by undesirable psychological effects. So not only was he an obstetrician, but a passionate psychologist too. For his beloved surgery, he developed an ingenious surgical clamp, the myomectomy clamp, to temporarily hold the blood supply of uterus so that we can venture through this operation nicely. In the era when no blood transfusion facilities were there, no chemotherapies or drug properly were there. Forget about that. Even anesthesia facilities were a luxury. He did more than 500 per nine procedures. To boast of, he had 14% mortality uh, rates in his cases. Sir Verdimes also came personally to visit him, and he had recorded 18% mortality rates in his original operations. So he congratulated this legend that you have reduced mortality rates. He has actually perfected his art. He had long waiting list for patients and short operating time, the kind of surgeons we all want to become. In the era when on mere detection of ovarian cysts or other pelvic pathologies, he used to frown. He used to frown on these lesser men who graciously handed over bowel problems to their brother specialists in urology and proctology, but not so this master who was as happy and competent operating on bowel or ureter as on the uterus. He was playing with all organs coming in his way after opening abdomen, for he was a staunch believer that the moment you put a scalpel on the skin of abdomen, you should be able to deal whatever comes in the way of you and uterus. He was perfecting beautiful art of ureter handling, bowel handling, and bladder handling. He was playing with the dynamics of post-operative bowel functioning. In those times where there was very high morbidity due to classical cesareans, partially due to bleeding, 
complications and partially due to reluctance by the fellow obstetricians to adopt this technique. He was the one who was perfecting this art of lower segment cesarean. Students from far and wide used to come and just to have a glance how he performed it. We all know tragedies are a part and parcel of our lives. We all are suffering a massive tragedy in the form of COVID-19 pandemic. He also suffered one. His wife was suffering from very heavy menstrual flow, resulting in severe anemia and a hysterectomy. Thus, the lesion had no children. This setback led to his lifelong advocacy, which deepened with each case for the more conservative surgery of myomectomy, as we all know. As if this was not enough, his wife experienced bowel obstruction around 10 days after hysterectomy. Again, this sad experience led him to also research bowel function and surgery uh, after surgery. So we see less paralytic ileus. We know more about fluid and electrolytes, chemistry and physics. We all know per operative measures and how important they are for reducing adhesion formation, especially during myomectomy operations. He became a pioneer in the field of less drastic procedures of ovarian cystectomy and myomectomy. So we can aptly call him as one of the first fertility specialists of the gynecology world. When people were having blues, probably due to his uh, tremendous success, he converted these blues into an invention known as Bonnie's Blue, which is used to sterilize and stain the vagina and cervix, thus reduce chances of post-operative infections. He was a master innovator who modified Riverdon Needle. Most of the OT table of ours is full with his inventions in the form of uterine artery forceps, tissue forceps, myomectomy clamps, tests like Bonnie's test for stress urinary incontinence or hood technique. He was an excellent medical writer. He uh, scriptured more than 200 medical literatures. His textbook of gynecological surgery and details about myomectomy and ovarian cystectomy is a sweetheart book to read even today. He was elected as vice president of RCS uh, and he vociferously objected to the formation of a separate wing of Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists because he believed we all are surgeons and we need not to be separated from each other. He was also first honorary fellow of the Royal Australian College of Surgeons and an honorary fellow of Associations of Surgeons, the American Gynecological Society. So not only his nat native place, but his fame wandered to each and every part of the globe. He is the man who, even after all these years, still manages to still paramount inspiration in young as well as experienced surgeons in the field of obstetrics and gynecology all across the, uh, across the world. Yes, he is Sir William Francis Victor Bonney, an exquisite surgeon, a stimulating thinker and leader, and a rare and generous teacher. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Shaila. That was indeed very interesting uh, sort of life history of uh, Dr. Bonnie that you just uh, presented to us. Thank you so much. And congratulations Thank you. for winning the prize. Well, congratulations, you. Dr. Shaila. Congratulations. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So now, now we move on to the session two of uh, this exciting KU uh, web series. Uh, it's, a, it's a talk on the topic myoma, treat or not to treat. I would first of all like to introduce the chairpersons for that. Uh, Dr. Gopinath, sir, we all know him. He's the past president of the Kerala Federation of Obstetricians, deputy director of Kerala Health Services from which he has retired. He's a consultant at Kannur Medical College, past vice president of the IMA Kerala State, and he has been a uh, portfolio holder of many, many organizations. So it gives me a immense pleasure to welcome Gopinath, sir, to this platform. With him to chair this session, we have Dr. Nisha Roshnima, Nishi Roshni, I'm sorry. Nishi Rashnima, who is an additional professor OBGYN at the Government Medical College in Trishur. She is currently the president of the Trishur OBGYN Society, vice president of the IMA Trishur, vice president of the Diabetic Club Trishur, and member of Medical Education Unit GMC Trishur. So I would now request Dr. Gopinath sir to kindly introduce our speaker, Dr. P.C. Mahapatra sir, a living legend himself and an uh, inspiration to all of us, not only here in the East, but nationwide and also worldwide. So, Gopinath, sir, over to you to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mahapatra, sir, please. Okay, good evening to everyone. Namaskar. So, first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pradipa Singh, the project coordinator of this knowledge update, and also Priyanko Roy, the coordinator, for inviting me to chair this session, where uh, our teacher of teachers, the great 
Dr. P. C. Mahaputra is the guest speaker. It's my duty to introduce him. Actually, he doesn't require any introduction to this uh, audience because all over India, he is very well known. And uh, but for the sake of introduction, I will go through the CV. He was the former vice president of Fox in 2004 and associate professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, SCB Medical College. And Dr. Mahaputra has been the organizing secretary of the 45th AICOG at Bhuvaneshwar in 2002. Is the joint organizing secretary of the sixth annual conference of the Association of Gynecological Oncologists in India in Qatar in 1997. And joining joint organizing secretary of the sixth annual conference of NAVSFWI in 1990 and Chairperson Medical Education Committee from 2000 to 2007. And he has also organized many prestigious CME programs across the country and actively involved in teaching undergraduates and postgraduates in OPGYN since 1986 and postgraduate examiner in Kolkata, Gauhati and Bairambore universities. And Dr. Mahaputra's contribution academy has taken him in across the globe leading and representing his peers in many associations. And uh, actually, he had come to Kerala twice and I had the uh, fortune of hearing him twice two years ago. And because of this uh, COVID pandemic, now we are all very lucky to meet in this virtual platform and hear the legends. And today he's going to speak about the fibroid the most common benign tumor, the recent advances, uh, whether to operate or not to operate. And we have a great session in advance. Thank you, sir. And I'm presenting you to this audience. The podium is yours, sir. Thank you, Gopinath, sir. Just, uh, I know Mahapatra, sir, doesn't like talking about him, but i just like to add on a couple of points that was not there in the CV, probably. He has been the past president of Foxy as well. And he has been the organizing chair of the last year in Bhuvaneshwar, which we thoroughly enjoyed. So, Mahapatra, sir, the platform is over to you for your talk. Thank you, sir. Reva Chairperson, uh, Professor Gopinath, Nishi, uh, viewers of this brilliant uh, KU series update uh, organized by Dr. Pratibha Singh and my brilliant uh, master of ceremony, my lovable Priyankur, my friend, philosopher and guide, Dr. Hema Divakar, the teacher of teachers and the chairperson of the CME committee of Foxy, Dr. Ava Singh, and one of my most favorite most learned and a burning gynecologist and a vice president of Foxy, Pasab Mukherjee, and uh, viewers of this great academic session organized by this SILD Healthcare and SILD Connect, ladies and gentlemen. Well, uh, I'm really very happy to be associated with this series because the SILD Connect, I remembered in the during the Corona time last year, I inaugurated the Sealed Connect by Anirudh were there and all that. We started a unlocking series, unlocking series of every month webinar for that. So now still the digital platform is very active and more active particularly when the waves and waves of Corona has come out. But the waves of Corona has not stopped gynecologists from academics. I think they have a potential, they have a strong power to win over any waves that come out and any danger that come out, which will not affect the academic scenario, particularly in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. And remember, for the last one year or so, there are many, many webinars. There is no dearth of webinars, but the gynecologist and Foxy and the various, uh, in the individual as an institutional forum, everybody is very active, starting from very, very genetic gynecologist to very adolescent gynecologists and a very active gynecologist like Priyankur, Generation and the Next Gen are so active in this webinar that they've met. We are, we are in generation where we are physically 
very very active very strong but digitally very weak now the younger generation are digitally very strong but physically never weak for that we hope after the corona issues everything will be settling and we'll have more of physical interaction as dr gopinath has told that yes uh, we will again move out all of the country and and propagate the education and not give the education i am here not to share not to give any information or update you about the knowledge i think i will share knowledge and being benefited by that these interactions will benefit me to update myself more and more at this particular age well uh, thank you pratibha for again emotionally blackmailing you, and uh, i know that pratibha um, i need not tell about all these because i am one of the family members of uh, pratibha where i salute the father in law of pratibha mother in law of pratibha sanjay and all that who loves me so much that they could postpone the yearly annual function of the vagalpur society to the next year when i am available for that i think you are really great and you love me so much that you can do anything for me and today and last uh, uh, 15 days back pratibha asked me about this i told that yes uh, i will be there but i didn't know about this details about this particular focused webinar i think i'm always in favor of focused webinar as rightly pointed out by many of uh, the uh, speakers like hema and basha that uh, the participation of the webinar unfortunately uh, real participation we cannot estimate and there are very few well this is for in general all the webinars and all that but when there is a focused webinar i think the knowledge people are were really those who are wanting to share knowledge and gain knowledge they are more attentive and they attend particularly for that and thank you that you have started with this focused webinar on a particular subject on myoma and that to a uh, great salute to the father of myomectomy victor bani and all that and you started nicely and saluting that the history and the total contribution of the great uh, visionary and legendary innovator in gynecological surgery victor bani i think that's a great thing i salute all of you for this particular inclusion of session on victor boni and uh, particularly felicitating the winners of the quiz i think that's something a great idea when dealing with the myoma and topic of myoma in this particular session so with this brief introduction i shall start my talk which has been given to me uh, pratibha has named it yes you have to give the name and all that and uh, Treat her not to treat. I think uh, I brings uh, greetings from the place of Lord Jagannath, and here is my topic: my my uterus. Very very common, as Dr. Gopinath has told, that is the one of the commonest benign conditions in the female, and uh, uh, prevalent in all age groups. But the main problem when it comes to this surgeons or gynecologist, I think the real dilemma occurs: treat her not to treat. So this is the really a problem which. all gynecologists face and there are many many innovations starting from victor vaini bonis period till today the myoma exist but there is a lot of changing trends and techniques in the different management either the surgical medical or or the expectant management and all that there are a lot of innovations and still we are not absolutely full proof and still there are a lot of controversies we have solved many of the controversies and reached a consensus but still we have a lot of things to way forward for that i think there is a great innovation still ahead of us from ben boni till today and in future for that now therefore commonest is one of the commonest benign conditions in gynec practice if you find that uh, every alternate day a patient of yours when we attend a gynec opd we find some sort of myoma and it has a wide spectrum of presentations it presents as it could present as uh, infertility it could present as a lump abdomen it could present as a pressure symptoms it could present as a menstrual abnormality and uh, uh, um, the, the the association with uh, endometriosis association with adenomyosis association with endometrial carcinoma there are a lot of uh, the presentations are varying and of course in quite a good number of cases we find an incidental finding asymptomatic i think that's the very important thing just by diagnosis by your modalities of investigations you don't subject the patient for treatment and uh, mainly prevalent from the adolescent to the genetic age group though it's a limited i think reproductive period the majority of these presents with the, some of the problems with that but it's not uh, um, rare to find out in adolescent 
nor to find out in genetic population also, post-menopause. Well, the pathogenesis, the rate of growth and relation with fertility, these are the three main things which is really till date we do not know. Till date, there are a lot of researchers regarding the pathogenesis. We know that it originates from the smooth muscle uh, cell of the myometrium, but whether there is a, like a theory that whether the smooth muscle vessel or uh, smooth muscles in the vessels of the myometrium originate for that, or the smooth muscle cells in the myometrium originate, and what is the inciting factor which stimulates the growth of this myoma? That's again really a problem for whether it's a hormonal, whether it's a genetic propensity is necessary, is, a, is there with that, or whether it's some exogenous um, uh, factors which are there, which leads to the uh, formation of the myoma for that. And more important is the rate of growth. When there is no different, there are various studies and literatures about the rate of growth of the myoma in the different racial indicators from black to white to various ethnic populations. I think the rate of growth is variable. And the rate of growth is not fixed because we do not know. Uh, we cannot predict that this after one year, a five centimeter myoma will be 10 centimeter. It's not possible. And individual variability is so much that a myoma still remains constant. But in some cases, the rate of growth varies, the growth uh, rapidly and all that. But it's the slow growing tumor that we know. Again, the last create, last problem is relation with fertility. It's very difficult to know whether the myoma, this particular myoma is, is a cause of fertility or not, excepting some situations like when the myoma is in the cavity, I think it's encroaching on the cavity or occupying the cavity. We can say that, yes, either it will cause a, a fertility or a productive uh, failure or a pregnancy loss or uh, presented, uh, presenting with the menstrual abnormality. That. That, that factor is known. But outside that, whether the intramural myoma or a subserous myoma is there or not, we do not know. But closer to the cavity, more is the incidence with the fertility or pregnancy loss. But away from the cavity or away from the endometrium, the, the chances are much less. So that we find the subserous myoma are less prone for any fertility problem for that. Again, it is a just an oversimplification. Even in intramural myoma, this is a structural thing, which, but functional thing whether it alters any environment change which is favoring the fertility, favoring the infertility. I think this is also a point of concern. There is a lot of researches also regarding the biochemical factors which is responsible or endocrinological factors which is responsible, even if this myoma is in intramural or subserious variety. The size and the number also is attributed for infertility, but we have seen all gynecologists must have experienced even multiple myomas of varying sizes. The pregnancy is there, the pregnancy continues uneventful, and the delivery is also uneventful for that also. And that's very short, and there's a very difficult million dollar question to prove that a myoma, if it is present, it is causing fertility for that. So it is still ill understood till today. And most often medically and surgically misused or abused. We do have some, if the myoma is there, we start some medical management and all that. And now newer molecules, we thought that this is a wonder molecule for myoma. The patient satisfaction, the, the doctor's uh, satisfaction, we write it and all that is most abused medically. And of course, surgical abuse is also known less. Any myoma that needs a surgical correction is absolutely a wrong concept for that. And therefore, the topic is treat or not to treat and train towards conservative surgery, minimal invasive surgery and non-surgical option for that. I think that's important right from the one is time. It's the, it's the psychological turmoil when we do a hysterectomy. Even elderly women, Bonnie was in favor of doing a myomectomy because the psychological upset after hysterectomy is more often. That concept was known way back in 19, 1940, 1950, like that. And therefore, till today, this exists in the era of minimal invasive surgery. We are always in form of a conservative surgery, more pioneer for that. Now, I will draw down a few controversies and consensus over the last few decades in management. Now, first of all, the classification. The type of classification, when we were students, we know that the myoma, either uterine myoma or extra uterine myoma. If it is a uterine myoma, there are various types, the three conventional type, submucous, intramural or interstitial, and subserous. These are the three varieties is there, though submucous has become a really a controversial uh, word. It should be subendothelial rather than submucous, because no mucus thing is there in the endometrium. See, it is a subendometrial that is a more appropriate and apt than submucous. But we classical, classically accept since decades about these three different classification types. Now, FIGO, when it came and all that, 
at least we have uh, a, a very good understanding about the grading of the Mayama. The grading of the Mayama is really gives a one step ahead of the classical three different definitions, the three different classifications of the old age classifications of submucous interstitial and subserous. The zero to eight, I think from start, from zero, starting from the cavity when the full Mayama, uh, the whole 100% of the Mayama is there occupying the whole of the uh, cavity, this is zero. And when it's completely pedunculated subserous Mayama, it is eight. And in between, there are a lot of other the percentage of Mayama occupying and uh, um, um, uh, projecting to the uh, submucous and the cavity or percentage of myoma projecting to the subserous. Again, it depends on this. And therefore, we classify into, again, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now, the diagnostic criteria. When it comes to the diagnostic criteria, I think this is an era where tech and touch, there should be a blend for that. We have got a lot of ancillary investigative gadgets to find out and diagnose myoma. But in the era where the gadgets was not there, the only thing is the two finger and your brain. I think two finger and two cerebral hemisphere are the main diagnostic criteria where you do a clinical examination and find out that this is a case of uterus enlarged, irregular, and correlating with the symptomatology, we diagnose that it's a case of myoma uterus. And of course, when the technology has come up and the new resolution sonography and imaging modalities have really turned off a very important thing in diagnostic armamentarium in all, all clinical disciplines, including gynecology, and more so particularly sonography, a high resolution sonography machine can diagnose myoma with utmost accuracy for that. And therefore, the when the uh, sonography uh, has come up, particularly a trans abdominal and trans vaginal sonography can detect a small myoma in the in the submucous variety for that submucous even if there are some cases when we earlier um, thought that it is a case of dysfunctional uterine bleeding as because they there is nothing inside and uh, you do that uh, even on uh, abdominal sonography it reveals that it's a normal scan but submucous sonography so the transvaginal sonography can reveal a small submucous myoma or a space occupying lesion for that this is once how the myoma, the sonography has changed the situation for that. The, again, another advantage of sonography is the power doppler, color doppler, because the controversy about the, when the rapidly growing myoma, when there is a suspicion of a sarcomatous change, I think the color doppler can also add to it. And that is again a benefit out of a color doppler for that. And beyond that, I think the role of MRI and role of CT. I think MRI is much more beneficial than CT in differentiating myoma with adenomyoma. The localized, the only problem with the sonography is that about 80% uh, of the myomas can be diagnosed with accuracy with sonography. But even if we have seen that sonography reveals that there is a myoma and on, on surgery we find on laparoscopy there is an adenomyoma localized. They're very well confused with the localized adenomyoma. And MRI can distinguish with 100% accuracy because the junctional zone is important. The consistency is not that hypoechoic lesion and a stri and strictly a capsule which is being found is designated as a myoma, but many times the adenomyoma can confuse us where the MRI can solve the issue. So diagnostic criteria, sonographing and MRI will be enough for that as a diagnostic criteria. Now again, I reveal that myoma and infertility is a million dollar question to prove that this is a case of infertility, uh, myoma causes infertility or not. Because structural, first of all, we must find out whether the structure of the myoma is such that it causes infertility. If it is encroaching on the endometrium or there is a submucous myoma, we think that it could be a cause of infertility. If the size intramural myoma is more than five centimeter documented by various literatures, that it could cause. It. But even less than that, is there a possibility of some biochemical changes, which is there? The number itself uh, also matters for that, so, apart from the location, because the biochemical parameter which we do not know what it changes, which causes the fertility, infertility for that. And myoma associated pathology, I have already told, adenomyosis, endometriosis, and carcinoma endometrium. Because these are the cases where it is related to the hyperestrogenic states for that. And estrogen perceptors where it's more often, myoma can be, uh, the growth can be much more for that.
Then another is the recurrent myoma. Some of the cases where you do a myomectomy, there are many gynecologists who have done seen myoma recurring after doing a myomectomy. Maybe that a small myoma which is there not detected could be there again a regrowth, or even a solitary myoma is there again some from another site another myoma can come out for that because it's a systemic. We do not know what is influencing the pathogenesis of the myoma, and if there is some endogenous factor which is responsible for the regrowth, the recurrent myoma is again a challenge to the treating. Uh, I think uh, physicians for that. Caesar and myomectomy. Then at the time when we were students, Caesar and myomectomy, we our teachers were telling, don't touch the myoma. There are only indications of doing a Caesar and myomectomy when there is a pedunculated subserous myoma. I think these are the only indications. Or there is a myoma sitting over the lower uterine segment over the presumed probable or presumed uh, site of incision. I think these are the two instances where you do a Caesar and myomectomy. The rest. You don't do a scissor and myomectomy, but now the trends have changed, and we are doing a scissor and myomectomy. Even large myoma, interstitial myoma, or uh, the intramural myoma, we can do. But the different techniques with there and changing trends, changing techniques. I will show some of my videos for that. Laparoscopic myomectomy. Can the area where laparoscopy, when the scope of laparoscope has advanced, and the indications of laparoscopic myomectomy has become very very common nowadays, mainly because of the reason. The 3D laparoscopy has given advantage out of it, and second important cause of that is a suturing. The main problem of the myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy, is suturing. Whether the suture suturing is effective, whether the strength or tensile strength of the suture bearing the pregnancy and all that, it could affect the pregnancy. It is going to be uh, causing the rupture uterus. For that, the suturing must be very good important. But at that time. We were doing a single layer suturing with the conventional vicryl sutures, very difficult, time consuming, and all that. Now, with the innovations of the quill suture, with the uh, barred suture, it is very, very easy to do even a two layer or a three layer suturing as we do in the case of uh, the open myomectomy. And that's a very important thing, change in innovations for that. And to add to it, the technique of reducing the blood loss by infusion of the vasopressin locally. Could be a drastic change in that. So the technology and the equipment has changed and all that. And lastly, about the morselator, a big myoma, the root root of removal. Before the when there is no morselator, we used to remove it through the pouch of Douglas, the caldotomy, and uh, large myoma were being removed for that. When the morselator came, morselator is a boon for that. But now the morselator is a big question in American, particularly after the case, legal implications is there. The Johnson has reduced uh, the Withdrawn the morselator for that. Even recently, just a few months back, I know that last month there was a the declaration by the FDA to remove even starch morselator. They are planning to withdraw this whole of the morselator company are withdrawing for that, and that's a really it could be a dangerous situation in removing the tissues for that. Hysteroscopic myomectomy, when hysteroscopic surgery, I think there's a really a rewarding surgery for that. The changing trends and changing techniques will be there. From monopolar to bipolar to shaving methods to various different new technology, we have changed for that. But abdominal myomectomy, when there is a irrem minimal invasive surgery is advanced, whether there is a place for abdominal myomectomy, yes, I could say that even if the conventional surgery is not uh, going to the graveyard, even with the advances in the minimal invasive, there are some indications where there is still a place for abdominal myomectomy in a very large myoma, in a multiple myoma, and particularly a recurrent myoma. There is definitely a place for abdominal myoma. Don't have a craze. There is no dogma in science. I think the individual decision is important. The skill of the surgeon, the indications of the case, and the individual profile, clinical profile, determines which method has to be done. It's not that doing an abdominal myomectomy is a step down, and you don't feel that you are inferior than doing a laparoscopic myomectomy. The safety is important. The result is important for that also. So everything there is a change. You must balance and find out. The different methods for that. Now shift to the medical management. Shift to the medical management. Way back before the newer newer molecules like ulipristone or mifepristone has come up, we were using the OCP, we were using the uh, GnRH channel lock quite a lot for that. But that's a temporary period. GnRH channel lock acts well. If there's a bleeding and the myoma reduction of the size of the myoma and arrest of the bleeding is bad. But this is a very uh, limited period and temporary. It cannot completely, it's not a permanent solution for that. And therefore, researchers have come up with the formulation of the new molecules 
two new molecules and medical management has come up, ulipristol and mifepristol. Believe me, when it came first, there are a lot of there are a lot of papers for that, and we thought that many people thought there is a wonder molecule, and it will uh, it will all kill the laparoscopic myomectomy surgeons. And in be, believe me, it's not a wonder molecule for that. There are merits and demerits of all these. There are indications where we prefer for that ulipristol and bifepristol. And initially they were proposing for three months. Now the extended period can be used. The safety is quite safe, except in some liver damage, liver diseases, and all that. Ulipristol. This doesn't have anything. Those has been studied five milligram and this uh, mefepristone 25 milligram is enough for that. Duration of efficacy is all absolutely a temporary thing. We find a variable report starting from a 10% to 50% reduction of the size of the myoma. That has been there. But one important thing I will give a message that pregnancy augmentation, nothing, no, these uh, two wonder molecules doesn't have any pregnancy augmentation for that. Whatever studies is there, it doesn't promote fertility, that's very shortened for that. Then the uterine artery embolization in the present status, what is the intuitive? So when the radiologist has started the interventional radiologist of uterine artery embolization, the basing on the concept that the myoma is a vascular thing, one vessel provides the nutrients to the uh, particular myoma, and if you block that, I think the is there, and uh, the size will reduce. In fact, it reduces the uterine artery embolization. Initially, there are, there are really a rule that the pregnancy, the adolescent and infertile patient, there is a contraindication of uterine artery emulation because it damages the subsequent fertility potential. <coughs> but now there are conflicting evidence that even there is not a contraindication for that. But whatever it may be, it's a temporary method. It cannot abolish curl of the mama. It cannot completely uh, cure for that. And it cannot be employed for all cases. In selected cases, we can do it. MR focus ultrasound has also have some values in that because it started with the secondary deposits then started with adenomyoma or myoma, particularly the multiple myoma were needing a lot of surgery, mutilating the uterus, mutilating the hydra by minimal invasive or open is uh, can be tackled with MR focus ultrasound. Power marcellator, again, I have told that there's a controversies and consensus in that. And therefore, we still, India, we are doing a power, the power marcellator. Some of them are very, they have designed some of the in bag marcellator in fear of the malignancy for that. But more important is that two things I will just say that the sarcoma, which you find, leomyosarcoma, the genesis is completely different than myoma. The genesis of leomyosarcoma and myoma are, are from the beginning. So, from the beginning, the case is destined to become a leomyosarcoma, and the, from the beginning, it's a myoma. Not that myoma converting into leomyosarcoma, very, very rarely we find that. That's one. Second important, we have got gadgets. Nowadays, the power, the power Doppler and other, uh, other uh, clinical manifestations of rapid, very rapid growth and associated pain and all that will give a, a caution for that. That is the case of leomyosarcoma. In that particular case, the morcellation should be really uh, open, uh, uh, is most preferable than myoma. But again, the controversy comes. Even if you are doing an open surgery of myomectomy, in a case of known Suppose it would have been a leomyosarcoma. There is also the amount of spill is there. So what justification, what is the logic behind this uh, Maya power morcellate revolution and converting into the myoma by open method for that? That's a, a controversy still uh, exists with that in the present status for that. So with this introduction, let me brief out a common clinical situations of uh, all these uh, uh, cases, treat or not to treat. And uh, this is a particularly a case where we find that yes, a case 25 years primary infertility, you are four years with oligosthenospermic male factor, and you do a diagnostic history laparoscopy. And there is a sonographic evidence of myoma. On laparoscopy, you find there is a myoma, subserious myoma on the interior aspect, and few settling myoma on the posterior. And this is another case where, again, a case of secondary infertility, the hysteroscopy is absolutely normal, cavity absolutely normal, and tubes are patent. And all these could be another factor for that. And this is a relatively larger solitary myoma on the posterior aspect for that. But there is no other factors for infertility. The tubes are patent and uh, uterus cavity is absolutely normal. So with this situation, what will we do? Whether these particular small myoma, shall we operate for that? If you operate, what will be the demerits for that? Are you going to improve the fertility for that? I think there's a big question mark for that whether to operate or not to operate for that. And therefore, the special things to note is that 
attribute to fertility potential. Very deep. You do all investigations to find out other causes of infertility. That's very important. Need for surgical intervention. Even there is a, when there is a cavity is normal, there is no need for surgical intervention. When you find a seedling myoma, just incidentally by sonography or by doing a laparoscopy for that. And rational treatment to method. So treat or not to treat is a very... So I think that if simple infertility is there with this small myoma, when the cavity is normal, I think there is a, you must think twice before contemplating the surgical methods and you do all the investigations to for infertility, other causes of infert infertility to find out the cause of infertility for that. And therefore the message is, think of other causes of infertility, evaluate and treat, cavity evaluation and a strong predictor, site, size, number, nature have a relevance to fertility potential, accuracy and interpretation of sonographic findings to be critically analyzed for that. This is another case in the era of master health checkup. Everybody goes to the corporate hospital, does the master health checkup, and this is a para one spontaneous vaginal delivery, normal cycle. There's no problem. She went for a master health checkup and revealed two myomas of 20 millimeter and 15 millimeter diameter. This is usually seen, all of you must have seen with the sonographic report. People come with the sonographic report, sir, I've got 20 millimeter myoma. They don't write two centimeter, they write 20 millimeter so that. 20 millimeter myoma is a big myoma for that instead of two centimeter myoma. And there is a patient is absolutely asymptomatic. What is the clinical approach? Implication of sonography report. By sonography, we use a treatment, need for a treatment. And this is the problem of master health checkup for that. And therefore, the patient developed that I have got a tumor and more could be, it could rise, it could increase, it could have a malignant potential. Lot of things, psychological turmoil comes to that. And therefore, I always say, it will take me one year to teach how to do surgery. It will take me five years to teach when to do surgery, but it will take me lifetime to teach when not to do surgery. So it takes five years to do learn to do a surgery. It takes 25 years to learn not to do surgery for that also. And that is very important. And as a surgeon, it is not that dissection is important. People thought that they're very good dissector, absolutely fantastic surgeon. No, it's not that. The dissection and decision both are important. When does a good dissection, he is the good craftsman. He is a technician. He is not a surgeon. He is an operator. I designate him or her as an operator. But with decision and dissection are there. I, I designate them as a surgeons. Now the era is to convert operators to surgeons. And that is the need of the workshop. That is the need of the, uh, the education knowledge update like Pratibha with Dajit and all that. I think that is the very important thing which every gynecologist should know. This is again a case, 25, 24 years, uh, A2. This is uh, abortion two. Two abortions are there. And first trimester abortion at 10 to 12 weeks. And menorrhagic cycle. The, all the investigators of recurrent pregnancy loss have been done. You see, the, the, to put a hysteroscope and find brilliant, two beautiful submucous myoma occupying that. And here is another case where we find another thing, the projecting the cavity on either side. This is definitely a cause which is attributable, which could be attributable for infertility or for pregnancy loss. I think these are the cases which must be tackled. And these tackling of the cases should be done with the submucous myoma, the transcervical resection and hysteroscopy is rewarding surgery for that is a rational procedure. The only problem arises whether you do with a single versus multiple sitting for that. In a single myoma, if the size is more than six centimeter and we require more time to develop it, and even with the bipolar resectoscope, it takes a longer time. If the single or multiple sitting, it's better that you do it in a multiple sitting. Don't, the uh, safety of the patient is primary. You don't devote more time because here is the problem where the resection of the myoma is the main thing where the fluid overload in a bipolar or the ammonia toxicity or in a unipolar is there for that. And therefore, unipolar we have abolished. And even in bipolar, remember, those who feel that bipolar are safe for that. Bipolar, there is no ammonia toxicity, but 2,500 liters at a time overload will be there. They will be going for a pulmonary edema. We have seen pulmonary edema for that also. And that's a very important thing. Single versus multiple sitting, one should do it. And pre-op preparations, if you want to have a pre-op preparations of GNRH unlock, big myoma, you can reduce the size for that. And precautions for endometrial damage. The big myoma, and particularly multiple myoma doing in a single sitting, 
very, very cautiously you do and preserving the endometrium. I think that's a very important trick of surgery and the innovations in the technique for that. And therefore, the, the good vision is necessary. The Lara and Chroma, which is there with the spice, can give a clear outline of the cleavage of the surgery. Even in, in grade one and two, two also you can do it with the scooping technology for that. You can find out for that. It's not that you level it at the level of the endometrium surface. You go beyond it and find out and can deliver it and grade two and grade three also with the development of the skill for that. So this is one of the cases where you find that there's a big solitary myoma and uh, uh, it depends on the chime and all that. It's my, the unipolar earlier, we're using the unipolar, you find and and uh, and the whole of the cavity, you just find out. And here is a case where we find the stuck of this, either you can cut the stock or better, if you cut the stock, the myoma will be, uh, will be uh, always uh, in the cavity for that. And ultimately, I have seen few cases where they spontaneously expels and severe pain will be there. So better to have a, a small amount and resection piece by piece and ultimately finish the procedure with that. And this is a very rewarding procedure, but the fluid balance is important. You take care of the fluid balance. The pressure is important. And uh, is I believe that, yes, endomat is absolutely a method. It's not that high pressure and all high pressure will damage that. But endomat, if you do it with the less pressure, with the strict monitoring and the good skill, you can do this very good job for that. So the message is space occupying is a common cause of recurrent pregnancy loss. Hysteroscopic resection is the rewarding results for that. Now, in adolescent, when we see a young adolescent girl, tons and tons of progestogens have been given for that. You evaluate this particular case, hematologist, sonoga variables, even without a, a hypoquic area. Now, here is a case where adolescents are not immune to myoma. So these are the cases is not fitted for the medical management for that. Even if you give that, and when we find a sonographic evidence of a myoma, you just confirm it by the hysteroscopy, and there is a big myoma filling hole of the cavity for that. And here is a case where there is an indication for the hysteroscopic myomectomy and the surgery. In, so in, in adolescent also, it's not the reproductive pregnancy loss. For the symptoms, patient is having a menorrhagia, which is not controlled with the conventional uh, medications. And, uh, and units and units of blood have been transfused for that. But the surgical management is important. You have to resect that. And this resection of the myoma, if it is a small myoma, you can do a saver system or a bipolar resection. Uh, or if there's a large myoma, you can do with single or a multiple sitting depending on the size of the myoma and your technical expertise for that. But hysteroscopic myomectomy is the answer for that. So rational of hysteroscopy, rational of laparoscopy. Here the case is completely stage zero, grade zero or one. There is no place for laparoscopic myomectomy. Even you do a laparoscopic myomectomy, there is some... Uh, if we compare laparoscopic with hysteroscopic myomectomy, in a case of intramural myoma or grade two and three also, you can do, if it is do it sitting, uh, two, three settings of hysteroscopy is much more preferable than doing a laparoscopy. You can finish it with the laparoscopic myomectomy with one, but you can, there's a liability, there's a risk of entry to the cavity, opening of the cavity and the subsequent risk could be there. And uh, the adhesions, ultimately the adhesions of laparoscopy following the procedure. So the hysteroscopy myomectomy is a more rewarding procedure than laparoscopy. So pre-op place of pre-op medications. I always believe that, yes, dilatation is making now misoprostols are available. Prior to that, we are using the uh, prostaglandins for that, endoprost, and rational surgery and type of surgery should be there. Need for non-surgery. If there is a non-surgical options is there, you find out, but the non-surgical options are not amenable and efficacious for that. And need for follow-up and subsequent management could be there for that. So the message, think of local agents in adolescent UB, not responding to hormones. Sonography and MRI, rational pre-op planning tool, pre-op medications place in reduction of size and elevation of symptoms for that. Non-surgical options is still controversial for that. And MIS is definitely there is a place for that. This is another case. 30 years, primary in 44 years, normal male factor, menorrhagic cycle with dysmenorrhea, uterus is 18 weeks, and sonographic evidence of myoma, uterus of 20 centimeter. And when we are doing a myomectomy, I think a particularly the laparoscopic myomectomy, I, we, I always prefer that, yes, it should be supplemented with MRI to have a junctional joint, to have a confirmation. And uh, here is a case, depending on the skill, you must do it. And now, the new innovations of a 3D lab or new innovations of the suturing technology of a barb suture, a size doesn't matter and big myoma can be, can be. And they, particularly, I prefer this myoma if there's a solitary big myoma, 
it is much more preferable and the location of the mama is also important where it is closer to the cornu where it's the tubes can be going to be affected by sutures and all that there are many factors could be there the vasopressin is a strong uh, i think boon for that but remember everything has a effect and a side effect for that also so when you are using the vasopressin there is a ask the anesthetist that yes it could cause bradycardia for that and a simple um, uh, i think uh, uh, vigilance could solve and prevent many of the complications for that. there are many reports of vasopressin uh, uh, toxicity and death following the vasopressin also because it's a callous uh, vigilance and all that simply you do a simple measure of a bradycardia you give a tropin and things will be all right for that but main thing any myomectomy you must do the proper bonny has given a lesson that this uh, the it has a capsule i think it should go right to the capsule and overcutting is more you just overcut don't cut it either doing a open or doing a laparoscopy you find out that if everything seems like that it's a, a capsule for that also and therefore if you overcut a little then you can find the real capsule and therefore you can deliver it and this is uh, earlier we are using the uh, myoma screw for that also now i find the instead of myoma screw this uh, uh, the uh, i think this is a indian devised uh, uh, hand instruments of uh, the tenaculum a laparoscopic tenaculum can be a very good help for the traction and counter traction and think after this how the area is more important and clean and all that now we find the same concept bonny has devised that primary incision and secondary tunneling incision there is another myoma which is there with the laparoscope i find that there is another myoma and with the secondary tunneling incision with the same myoma same incision i have found that yes there is another myoma which can be delivered it with the same incision with not that two incisions are necessary for that so this is known as a secondary tunneling incision which myoma which bonny has uh, given us the idea for that in open surgery and we have converted that same thing into the a laparoscopic approach for that and after this procedure you just have two layer closure or three layer closure with the barb suture and with complete hemostasis the things are much better the short term and the long term prognosis is much better for that this is another case an unmarried girl of 20 years with a multiple myoma of uh, about 24 years 28 week size stenography multiple myoma here i say that don't take a credit and uh, of doing a, a laparoscopic myomectomy and that the risk at the safety of the patient is important and completeness of the procedure is important don't have agitation for abdominal there is a place for lap abdominal myomectomy for that also because uh, it depends maybe that we can convert this procedure we can do by laparoscopy but it takes a number number i think uh, it takes a lot of time by doing a laparoscopy and we cannot uh, do the justice for ultimately doing that and safety is also an important part for that so these are case the type of surgery again same thing we go for uh, the overcutting of the tissues small seedling myoma we can just coagulate and find out without any suture also but suturing we can do this is a subserous myoma which you can suture it which you can do with the coagulation and without suture also with the coagulation it can be done for that and uh, the big intramural myoma and subs the interstitial myoma is needs a uh, i think uh, um, good entry to the capsule and uh, good suturing technology for the uh, po immediate post operative and late late uh, i think complications of the uh, possible rupture of the case in case pregnancy occurs for that so the uh, the suture must be very good and the results of uh, the uh, suture i think the healing of the uh, wound should be very good this is what i told that this is overcutting you just overcut and then you can find out the real cleavage for that otherwise everything will look like a cleavage for that this is the tip tricks and tricks of uh, myomectomy for that if you go to the proper cleavage i think uh, you can uh, uh, do the things without any uh, complications for that so this is uh, uh, very important for that you going for a pulling no sir please continue with your talk sir I'm sorry sir all right so now this is uh, that therefore i say that yes it's not a absolute contraindication abdominal myomectomy is not got out of the hey john will you so the message is myoma not uncommon in adolescence surgery is the mainstay fortality preserving techniques to be adopted so i think care 
about the uh, tubal damage should not be there and minimum scar and particularly as far as possible the anterior incision is much more preferable than posterior incision for that so before that an adequate counseling should be there we back long back i find this particular case presented with acute acute pain abdomen with a mass and all that and it's a 28 weeks uh, mass with an acute and sonography reveals a myoma uterus when i find that this is a case of p- the pedunculated myoma large pedunculated myoma and undergoing torsion and with adhesions and all that i think this could be done by laparoscopy or by laparotomy and all that and fortunately you see the patient is so fortunate that it's a big a subserous pedunculated myoma you just uh, uh, remove it and the whole uterus anatomy is normal i think this uh, rare cases which you find very rarely which can be tackled with uh, abdomen but this can be this is one instances where they present with uh, the uh, acute abdomen and acute pain abdomen this is a case a primary gravida uh, conceit following investigation for infertility for 10 years known myoma uterus regular anc 38 week ended in a premature rupture of membrane and emergency seizure and section for fetal distress and tor male baby was delivered i find that this is a case where the video you can see that yes i have used the vacuum in all cases i deliver the baby by vacuum and then in the posterior aspect this is a new innovations intra cavitary myomectomy there is a large myoma of about 10 to 20 cm diameter which is there which is diagnosed in the antenatal period but this is a case where a new i have not given a separate incision posteriorly through the intra cavitary i find that given incision find a cleavage and run through the cleavage and separated and then a big uh, 20 cm myoma with a good cleavage i find that this is a case where it could be delivered and all that and after that the you find a big myoma when it is delivered and the dead space is peculiarly less the dead space which you find the uh, is because the whole uterus is contracted we find a less of space in comparison to the case where i would have given posterior a separate incision for that the same incision through the cavity after delivery of the baby before suturing the uterus you just do uh, give an incision if it is anterior with the retractor you place an incision anteriorly or posterior you give an incision posteriorly and a big intramural myoma is not a contraindication for the myomectomy lap incision and myomectomy when initially it was thought that uh, it is only restricted to the subserous myoma or myoma occupying the anterior surface for that so this is a cesarean so by that we uh, with the single surgery we can uh, do the two two step procedure we can avoid it and the patient is uh, really comfortable and now we find we are suturing the in layers as as in open conventional myomectomy we find a dead space and uh, here the redundant uh, portion of the tissue is excised and uh, whole thing we can just uh, close it with that and peculiarly a large myoma of 20 cm the the size is reduced to very very small and just uh, putting it in layers and closure we can reduce the laser and then we can start closing the uh, the in two layers we can close that this is last second layer of closure of the myoma in a big myoma so this is one which we find i practice since last 15 years i am doing this particular thing of intra cavitary approach and particularly in a case of intramural myoma and yesterday's contraindications are today's indications and i find i am very um very crazy to do cesarean myomectomy if it is operable not that if there is a sidling myoma you operate and mutilate the uterus for that if it is an operable if the surgery is necessary i think you do the surgery i think there is a, you know, there is many many advantages for that and post operatively you find there is no much of uh, morbidity for that so after closure of that the same thing the cesarean the old uh, the whole the two layer of the uh, the uh, upper end and lower end as as conventional closure of the uterine incision uterine can be done for that so this is one way which i think that it's a very good thing where uh, my youngsters could know that yesterday's contraindications are today's indications not only limited to subserous subpedunculate myoma or enteral myoma in cervical region dead space closure is easier bleeding is less post op complications are minimized and it's a novel technique which i propose you do it and then you can realize and remember that this is a good technique for that this is another case where we find that yes 26 years old primary gravida with 8 weeks pregnancy general condition okay pa uterus 26 weeks sonography intrauterine life pregnancy 8 weeks with large intramural myoma and she wanted she was very much determined to do a termination of pregnancy 
and a previous counseling was done that you terminate the pregnancy, do a myomectomy, then start the pregnancy. I have an opposite view for that. I continue let, if there is a chance of abortion, spontaneous abortion, let it be there, but don't terminate the pregnancy. And these are the cases where the pregnancy continued, uneventful pregnancy continued, LSS planned for bridge presentation and large intramural myoma and anterior encroaching the lower segment. Again, intragravitary myomectomy could serve. There are many instances where even cesarean was not in it. It was a bridge presentation. Cesarean was not indication. We allow for a vaginal delivery also. And majority of the cases do have a very favorable outcome for that. So need for termination, type of ANC, place of vaginal delivery, precaution during cesarean, place of myomectomy during cesarean, and place of cesarean hysterectomy are to be very well known by the uh, decision of the surgeon. So pregnancy with myoma is a common association, continuation of pregnancy and uneventful outcome, common phenomena, invariably vaginal delivery, feasibility of myomectomy during cesarean to be considered for that, routine myomectomy during cesarean for that. This is another case, there are three cases which have so that it's a vaginal myomectomy. First is about the 32 years para two. This is a case, menometrasia, not responding to progesterogens, telemedicine reveals tons and tons of progesterone. There is no speculum, nobody has put the speculum for that. And putting a speculum, I find a myometrase polyp in the OPD setup also, just, just evolve, they don't push, pull it. Just to have a twisting long since automatically it will come out for that. And the patient is reduced of symptoms. And um, I think these are the cases. Unnecessary, unnecessary progesterogens has to be given. There's another case which came with, uh, uh, again, manometragia and presented with acute retention of urine. And sonography reveals that it's a case of cervical myoma planned for hysterectomy. In a case of 32-year-old and uh, uh, hysterectomy with two units of blood transfusion, when I saw this, I found that there is a the myoma arising from the posterior lip and, and completely uh, <coughs> stretching the whole of the vagina for that. So yeah, the, uh, she is 32, para 1, and uh, with the large myoma of about uh, 8 centimeter diameter, you give an incision doing a vaginal myomectomy and close it. I think this is enough for that and follow up of that patient. Beautiful service post operatively, you find it out, and patient is absolutely relieved of the symptoms. And these are the cases unnecessary hysterectomy is avoided for that also. So this is one case. Second important, uh, mm -hmm. uh, another case I will show you. This is a case RH negative and uh, hemoglobin was uh, 5 gram percent and patient was uh, uh, having a, a menometrasia and on examination we went just a myoma peeping on the endocervical canal for that and uh, this has been decided under multiple blood transfusion which has to be given for uh, the hysterectomy is planned for that. And uh, this is there in the during the COVID period and all that. I thought that I thought that hysterectomy could be avoided with the parental iron and all that. I saw this and under short GA and TIVA, uh, the pentothal, uh, you do that and uh, you could find that the big myoma, it's a uh, 90% are inside the cavity and 10% is only seen for that. And just uh, same methodology of uh, the uh, not pulling, it's uh, just a twisting up myoma rotation automatically the, it, it slips on from that area and uh, uh, the whole thing is completed within very very short period and patient is relieved of the symptom for that no need of hysterectomy in these type of cases for that so decide what is the case for the diagnosis evident clinically rationality of speculum examination hormone abuse is common treatment is very simple any gynecologist in the opd setup can do need for hysterectomy is not there for that so the message detailed clinical evaluation mandatory, vaginal myomectomy, polypectomy, simple procedure, think of presence of additional myomas and evaluate for that. Hysterectomy is not often necessary and follow-up is there. This is another case, para three, and uh, menorrhagic cycle, two years, clinical finding, okay, normal finding, normal pelvic scan, normal histological problem, absolutely normal. But when we put a diagnostic hysteroscopy, we find that there is a, a myoma, submucous myoma here, and this submucous myoma, Problem arises when you find a diagnosis of submucous myoma. Ask whether she wants to retain the uterus or not, whether she wants to for menstrual function. The question of fertility doesn't arise here. So, here, if she wants a conservative surgery, we can do the transcervical resection of the myoma. Otherwise, hysterectomy could be an option for that because if she doesn't want it, the menstrual function for that, hysterectomy can be done for that. So, the need of surgery, type of surgery, conservative or radical, role of hysterectomy has to be explained. And role of medical management, I think there is a list role of medical management for that. This is another case, para 2, both LSCS and uh, menorrhagic cycle for three years, mid position, bulky, farm restrictive mobility, and on sonography reveals multiple intramural myomas of one to two centimeters, small myomas. 
hysteroscopy was done normal endometrium was proliferative now what is the method need for hysterectomy i think it's a it's a second choice for hysterectomy place of medical management yes it's a medical management i think alternative methods are mirena put a mirena and find out and these are the cases all mamas doesn't need with hysterectomy my mirena is an answer for that and the message is counseling place of medical management is there think of alternative to hysterectomy hysterectomy could be a last resort for that this is again a post menopausal lady and uh, uh, para 3 pain abdomen sonography intramural mama 4 cm diameter clinical evaluation of absolutely normal pelvic findings number so a detailed uh, evaluation of the sonography basing on the endometrial thickness is important if the endometrial thickness fortunately it came as 3 mm and here by virtue of 4 cm mama is not a case for a hysterectomy for that it should be a follow up and all that and treat or don't treat here need for follow up is there other associated malignancy the endometrial thickness is more evaluate and then you can do hysterectomy not because of mama but because of the endometrial thickness or possibility of uh, the carcinoma developing for that so therefore increase size vasculitis there is a need of intervention need for follow up should be there for that and this is another case where it's a very atypical case 48 years para 2 previous to cesarean section underwent lap hysterectomy 2 years ago by one of my student <coughs> and he presented with pain in left iliac fossa <coughs> not relieved with medication sonographic evidence of hypercircumscribed lesion of 12 cm and of course they immediately thought that it could be a residual ovarian tumor and more possibly malignancy now the markers are tumor markers are negative when i put a scope i find this is a myoma on one end it's a very atypical case ovary is absolutely normal and only cystic and there is a myoma in one corner i think this is a, a myoma which has developed subsequently it's not that pre existing myoma because it has done a laparoscopic hysterectomy earlier it could have been notified for that but uh, this type of myoma this is a vasopressin which is being infiltrated and uh, uh, it's a very simple procedure where you infiltrate the vasopressin and uh, deflate it and continuously i think with a single 20 ml of vasopressin is enough for that also but believe me vasopressin don't give more as a 1 ml 20 units is enough for that and dilute with uh, about 100 ml of normal saline don't uh, uh, under dilute it concentrate it will cause more of damage and just record it intra intra uh, operatively ask the uh, anesthetist to record for that and uh, this is a very simple thing you just dissect it and uh, uh, just lift it with the uh, myoma screw or with your uh, the tenaculum forceps and uh, believe me you don't find anything uh, after the procedure uh, you completely leave it as such and uh, even if you don't suture also there is not a problem of dead space and uh, just uh, uh, the the hemostasis is important for that and patient is absolutely normal uh, after this myomectomy for that so these are some of the atypical cases which uh, many of them this myoma screw which are, i have so i will show this after the tenaculum and this myoma screw Uh, will just attraction and counter attraction with it but the most important is the cleavage initially the cleavage is there and this is a myoma separator this is the myoma separator indigenously i think there are many indigenous pharma like pb and all that they are manufacturing is very good myoma separator india genius is indigenous i think these are the cases where you just a tough uh, myoma separator this designator is a myoma separator and just uh, just separate the myoma with the traction counter traction you completely go through the very avascular space and you need not uh, bother about suturing also you leave it as such and the peritoneum is automatically there and if you want it you can put a quill suture for that and just coagulate that so these are the cases where a typical case one i have shown you for that so a typical case following unlucky gynecologist and unlucky uh, patient and these are the cases for that another case 50 years both para 2 both lsa sister myomectomy twice abdominal hysterectomy for ikar this one of my uh, teacher's wife and uh, he can he consult i was surprised is a fund of surgery or what both cesarean two hysterectomy two myomectomy two sittings and then abdominal hysterectomy again a recurrent myoma there is a lobectomy was done mediastinal myoma was there and uh, i salute the lady who has undergone such an operation for that she again came with pain abdomen off and on not relieved with medication sonography ct mri non committent findings so only pain abdomen and when i put a uh i think uh, this uh, this is a case you, when we see when i put a scope i find that these are all it seems that it is a malignancy or tuberculosis then i find that this is all leiomyomatosis and uh, believe me uh, i have uh, 
uh, send the specimen for uh, histopathological examination. It turns out to be leomyoma. I have done a progesterone receptor, E2, E2, E2P2 receptor uh, analysis, and then subsequently the progesterone was uh, positive. So I thought of giving a mifepristone. At that time, mifepristone was not available, only available for termination of pregnancy. So the, my teacher brought it from UK, and I didn't know the dose also for that. I told that give smaller doses and 25 milligram uh, from 100 milligram, you get a 25 milligram and got it. And then this I, I long before mifepristone came, then I find that about after, before 15 years, I had given the first mifepristone in this patient particularly. And subsequently the pain has subsided. I have uh, asked, I, I don't dare to do again a re-surgery and a laparoscopy to check that everything is settled or not. But the patient is relieved of the symptoms and pain is completely relieved for that. So these are the cases where, uh, interesting case of atypical cases where we find. These are the myoma which has invaded uh, the omentum and I just uh, resected the myoma and sent it for histopathological examination. I was thinking that it could be uh, uh, malignancy, but it's a, so surgical no scope, medical is the ideal, take a unipistol also for three scopes, but it's a relief from symptoms now, again, uh, after that uh, mifepristone for that. This is a case where last, uh, I think uh, time is up, I don't, don't prolong it. 45 years old, para three, all vaginal delivery, menorrhagic cycle with perception of plump abdomen, uterus was 20 weeks, sonographic evidence of multiple myoma for that. And need for hysterectomy, root, medical management, and place. I think these are the cases way back in 2007 I did this. I was very young at that time. Now I'm old. I'm not daring uh, surgeons now. I thought I will start with the vaginal hysterectomy with that. And uh, because myoma, when it's found in comparison to the adenomyoma, myoma doing a myomectomy. By doing a myomectomy, you can reduce the size and can deliver it by vaginal route for that. So these uh, at that time, I was using uh, the vessel cellar system since 2005. And of course, uh, I did that. I tried to attempt that. I thought why uh, in a myoma, I will reduce the size and then deliver it. And all types of myomectomy, then debulking, bisects, everything you adopt for that. And uh, luckily, I could do that. The main presumption is that when there's a myoma is uh, there after uterine ligation or uterine vessel sealer, you do the procedure. But there are some cases where it is not possible always. If it is a low down and it is not approachable, you have to do with that. And this is my favorite instrument uh, and vessel sealer and seal safe technology by Martin Maxim. We're using now a lot of uh, better technology or uh, uh, equal technology can come out, out of that also. And we do this procedure under this. Uh, but main thing is that you do the same procedure, either by suturing also, you can do the same procedure. But thing is that you have to do a myomectomy, go to the proper cleavage, and then only you can uh, uh, do the procedure for that. So uh, this is the uterine artery. I'm trying to do that. Um, but before, it is not very easy to reach for that. So that's why I did a bisection to find out to uh, diminish the size of the uterus, to find out the cleavage of the mama, where the location is there for that. And when I got uh, uh, one of the cleavage for that, then I stopped that and doing a starting a mama. I feel that yes, there is a cleavage. I separate it and the mama screw, conventional mama screw, which we were using it, that uh, we use it with that and conventional mama screw, that mama, you just fix it and just give a traction and it will come out for that. And these are the cases where large mama can be delivered by vaginal root. And only thing is that you have to reduce the bulk of the myoma, bulk of the yes, uh, uterus by doing a myomectomy for that. It's not enough. When we find, when I go, when I went uh, more ahead for that, another myoma is on the right side, more on the broad ligament area for that. So the only trick is that you find out uh, the proper cleavage and then you find out the proper cleavage and with the myoma screw, give a traction and a counter traction and my Caesar will uh, just giving a, a cleavage and uh, just hooked it and find out. And this is a uh, cat's paw, which also added in, in uh, addition to the myoma screw for the traction. And this uh, with the correct cleavage uh, by the scissor, we just find out the myoma and see uh, when the cleavage is good, even a large myoma can come out easily. And by tracks, just doing a traction, don't take a lot of energy for that. And don't uh, think that it will take a lot of uh, uh, time for that. And gradually, if you pull it, you are astonished to find out a big myoma which is coming out of that also. And with the list of bleeding for that. So this is one of the techniques for which you can deliver the good, 
and uh, still i find that there is another mamma you can find this is the uterine artery which you can see and just uh, cleavage it uh, uh, with the bipolar vessel sealer and then do the job and complete the hysterectomy another mamma is again found the multiple mamma but once you find the major bulk is out i think there is no problem for that and you can deliver it with the utmost efficacy for that and this is uh, how you deliver it by posteriorly and uh, another mamma you uh, just reduce so if the size is much more and uh, you find that uh, dissipated 24 week size also you can deliver it but the mamma is easier than the adenomyoma for that so myomectomy you do a myomectomy even in the open also even with laparoscopy if you find a broad ligand mamma you do first a myomectomy then do a so the main advantage is that you are uh, avoiding the ureteric injury for that so that's the main procedure in cervical mamma in broad ligand mamma do the myomectomy first and therefore this is the quick for surgical option for that so the controversy is the seizure and myomectomy have really um, solve the issues uh, do it and you yourself do it the intracavitary approach and younger generations can do much more better than me priyankur it is a just a stimulus to you laparoscopy myomectomy there are changing trends changing techniques but don't be crazy after all these procedures the safety is important the result is important basing on the result if this procedure is suitable then you do it otherwise there is a plenty of other procedures and uh, you have to develop the skill hysteroscopic myomectomy unfortunately i find that there are more number of laparoscopic surgeon in gynecology than hysteroscopic surgeon i want to promote hysteroscopy also hysteroscopy is my, don't designate yourself as tlh specialist as conventionally younger generation are more in favor of tlh you designate yourself as endoscopy gynecologic endoscopist and hysteroscopy myomectomy there is a lot of rewarding results for that also abdominal myomectomy still there is a place in the era of uh, the uh, minimal invasive surgery revolution medical management i have already told about the new molecule ulipristol indication safety dose duration efficacy but it pregnancy augmentation doesn't occur and it's a temporary method for that it cannot say that it's a completely a new and wonder molecule for that previously ocp gnr channel log were given mifepristone was also given and now mifepristone is side side effects are much less <coughs> than that but temporarily these are the cases when the continuous bleeding not responding to hormones you give it for a temporary period and then do a surgery also this is there alternative i have already uh, revealed about the uterine artery embolization mr mr focus ultrasound though is a costly procedure and uh, it could be a place merina is certainly a place as i have already told for that power morselator genesis of sarcoma i have told that is uh, origin is different pre treatment evaluation is important in back morselation is there the myth and morsel myth versus reality are more and crazy americans and genius indians unfortunately after the legal issues more most of the american patients have shifted to india for the skilled procedure for myomectomy also that i have also found for that and these are the take home messages my my commonest benign entity in females varying spectrum of presentations from asymptomatic to symptomatic fertility attribute difficult to explain treatment modality expectant medical and surgical search for newer molecules is still to be awaited for that trend towards conservative surgery in organ preservation mis and endoscopic surgery a technical innovation sarcoma myth versus realities and controversies and consensus is well defined and future thoughts are there priyankur you can find out go to any baba in himalaya and learn a technique of mantra enchant a mantra and whole mama could be out so that you will say that what this bloody surgeons of yester years are doing cutting coagulation removing and all that and all, uh, i enchant a mantra of myomectomy my mama is totally out without any surgery for that also i wish that could be successful for that thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i have taken enough time i don't want that uh, i will proceed more for that thank you Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, so, so very much, sir. That was indeed a wonderful talk. I dare just say one thing over here. I just like to correct one thing that you said. That is, you are not old. That you are probably the youngest surgeon that is present in today's audience. That yeah, was a awesome, uh, wonderful talk, sir. And I would also Thank like you. to say one thing of yours, which we always remember: uh, know when to operate and do not operate always. That is another learning that uh, definitely takes us youngsters ahead. So thank you so much, sir, for that. I would now like to invite our chairperson, Dr. Nishi Roshni, ma'am, to kindly uh, give a, give a comment. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, the organizers, for giving me a chance to be a part of this educational program, especially to chair the session where P. C. Mahabharata sir is giving a talk. It was a blend of knowledge, evidence, experience, 
wisdom, clinical judgment, and surgical ex excellence. It was a, such a fruitful session, and we have seen how and when to do a surgery. That is, a, depends on the grading of the myoma and also location of the myoma, how this can be identified <laughs> by the various investigative modalities in different phases of one's life, whether in adolescent group or postmenopausal group how to decide on doing a, treating a person or how to choose between medical versus surgical, the different routes of surgery, especially the cesarean section myomectomy, the intracavitary approach was superb. Also, uh, when to choose, even not to abandon um, um, abdominal uh, route uh, when we have to do a huge myoma. It was a wonderful experience. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation and knowledge providence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, so very much, Nishi ma'am and Gopinath sir for chairing the session. And PC sir, as always, when, when we know that you're going to talk in a webinar or in a conference, the excitement stays from before and ends right till the thank you slide of yours. Yeah, so thank, thank you, you so thank much you. Sir, for the talk. Thank you, sir. Thank Thank you. Yeah, I would good. like to thank sir. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful talk, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation, sir. In spite of being so busy, you were here with us. Thank you so much, sir. I have to be. I have to be with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you thank so you very much, much, sir. Now I request Diksha to kindly take the viewers' question and then take us ahead with the session three. Thank you so much, Priyankur. And uh, on my behalf also, I would really like to thank uh, Mahapatra sir for such a wonderful oration and talk. And sir, I'm sure that all youngsters uh, really appreciated all the interesting videos, the different case scenarios, your crisp messages, and especially the tips and tricks uh, which you gave us today, which, uh, which are so uh, important in real life situations. And these are patients which we face in our daily OPD every day. So thank you so much sir for your valuable time today and, uh, and uh, thank you sir and now uh, we move on to the surprise viewers question so can I have that on the screen so the viewers question for this episode of the KU web series is the drug which has no effect on the size of fibroids is A. GnRH agonist B. Danazol C. Pigestron and D, Mifepristone. Uh, so this is like a very um, uh, awaited session and uh, the results of uh, this viewer's question will be announced in the next episode. So everyone, uh, uh, we as uh, we saw earlier, we have very interesting prizes. We usually have uh, books signed by our chairpersons and guests and a certificate of appreciation for all the winners, uh, which Pratibha Ma'am will announce in the next uh, web series. Yeah, so, thank uh, you, Diksha. Yeah. Yeah. Please move on so, to the session three. Yeah, so we move on to the session three. And I think uh, Sir has uh, left uh, very few things to debate, but we still uh, have a very interesting debate, uh, which is the next session. And that is a debate between medical and surgical management of fibroids. And for this, I now invite my chairpersons for session three. Uh, our first chairperson is Dr. Raghavendra Prasad. He's the director of infertility and fetal maternal unit Sunrise Hospital, Kanangar, and an executive director in ARMC IVF Mangalore. Welcome, Dr. Raghavendra. Uh, our next chairperson for this session is Dr. Fessy Lewis, sir. Sir is senior consultant and associate professor in charge of the MCH course. Uh, Amrita uh, Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. He's the Foxy Vice President elect 2021. Isa, National Executive Member, Vice Chairperson, Kerala Chapter of IGE, IOS, ICOG Governing Council Manager, Secretary, Kerala Chapter of ISAR, uh, All India Foxy, International Academic Exchange Committee Chairperson, Member, FIGO Reproductive Medicine Co-Committee, uh, Co and a SEPOG Executive Committee Member. Uh, welcome, uh, Fessy, sir, as a chairperson for the debate. And uh, now I invite Dr. Rajendra Prasad, sir, to introduce our speakers for this session. Yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, before I introduce anyway, I would like to thank uh, Pratibha Madam for giving me the opportunity. And uh, directly, uh, the speaker today, Dr. Archana Kumari. She is an associate professor, Department of OBGYN, Rajendra Institute of Medical Science, Ranchi. 
So master training trainer for IMOF, HIV TOT, SAT SAT TOT secretary, ISO PA RB Ranchi chapter 2022, executive member 2019, founder secretary of IFS Jakan chapter 18 to 20, East Zone coordinator Quiz Committee Foxy 18 to 20. Convener Clinical Research Committee, Foxy 2019-21, Secretary 2007-2009, and Vice President 15-19, Ranji OBG Wine Society. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, and I hope the time which is allotted to me uh, will start after I start sharing my screen. And time which was given to me by Pratibhati was seven minutes, I think. So I still start sharing my screen. Is it visible? Yes, yes, yes. yes. it is visible, yes. So I'm going for the slideshow now. Yeah. Respected chairpersons, uh, distinguished guest speakers, um, chairpersons, and the viewers, the debate today is on medical versus surgical management of fibroid. If you look at the prevalence of fibroid, it is as high as 50 to 60%, and half of them are asymptomatic. So do all of them need treatment? Of course not. But when we look at the two major treatment options for fibroid, medical versus surgical management. My opinion is surgery is definitely not the only option, though that is a common misconception. My preference would be for medical management of fibroid. And the reasons are, there are so many factors which affect the management options of fibroid, age and parity, the symptoms and its severity, the desire to retain fertility, proximity to the menopause, and of course, the location, size, and number of myomas. So we look at the certain case scenarios, and you are yourself the best judge to determine the treatment option. A, a 28 years old Nali Peru is trying to conceive ultrasound source 2 fibroid 3 and 4 centimeters. He's asymptomatic with mild dysmenorrhea. Of course, we are not going to offer his surgical treatment at PC cell has already endorsed in his talk. So the treatment, uh, it would be just a watchful waiting and maybe some few drugs to relieve her dysmenorrhea. Another case, 34 years, para 2, not desirous of having future childbearing, but she's having heavy menstrual bleeding over past few months, ultrasound source 2 fibroids. So here again, the treatment would be a range of medical options for her. Another case, 47 years, para 2, perimenopausal, who has developed heavy menstrual bleeding over past few months, ultrasound again shows to uh, fibroid, and she has already been counseled to undergo hysterectomy. And if, the, if she comes to you for second opinion, you would definitely offer her a range of medical management, maybe um, LNG IUD as well. Another case, 42 years, para three, who develops heavy menstrual bleeding over past few years to the extent that she becomes anemic with hemoglobin of 6.5%, a big fibroid of 10 centimeter. Here again, before surgery, she would need a preoperative medical treatment, maybe with GRH and agonist to treat her anemias. So friends, there are definite indications of medical management of fibroid. Uh, they include mild to moderately symptomatic fibroid in any age group, fibroid in women approaching menopause, young women waiting for conception. And of course, this medical management comes as a rescue and help to my worthy opponent's surgical management as well preoperatively to correct anemia, to shrink myoma, and to reduce the vascularity, and sometimes to postpone surgery as well. So let us look at the advantages of medical treatment along with the evidences. In medical management, we have a range of drug uh, to choose from. We have more choices ranging from NSAIDs to anexamic acid, oral contraceptive pills, GNRH agonist to antagonist, SPRM in the form of mifepristone, esoprisnil, and aromatase inhibitor. And of course, we have the option of so such a good device, LNG IUD, which is a very effective medical treatment in premenopausal women. It can serve as an alternative to hysterectomy. And we have evidences for the role of LNG IUD for the treatment of symptomatic fibroid. Of course, due to paucity of time, we are, I'm not going to 
uh, in the details of the study, but the highlighted portion you can see the systematic review shows LNG IUS is a very effective and safe treatment for symptomatic fibroid in premenopausal women. Similarly, there's evidence supporting the use of long-term low-dose mifepristone for the treatment of fibroids, especially in perimenopausal women or young infertile women. Recently, a very good evidence has come in favor of the oral GnRH antagonist, Elagolix, uh, published in a New England Journal of Medicine. It is an RCT, which shows that the study arm uh, treated with Elagolix and Advec therapy had a symptomatic relief in 85.7% cases compared to only 8.7% in a placebo group. There are evidences to support the use of GnRH agonist or uliprestyl acetate prior to surgery like myomectomy to reduce the blood loss and of course to reduce the blood transfusion as well. And there are going to be more wonder drugs coming in these uh, in future as a result of research. There would be uh, perfenidone, lanreotide and catechins like EGCG which is available in green tea extract. And if I am allowed to include the non-surgical interventions uh, in my armamentarium of medical management, I have more options of having uterine artery embolization, MRA-guided uh, focused ultrasound, vaginal occlusion of uterine artery. And there are evidences to support uterine artery embolization as a procedure similar to hysterectomy with a lower complication rate and faster recovery. When uh, we look at the cost effectiveness uh, there is definitely a huge economic burden uh, with uh, respect to the surgical treatment of fibroid as compared to the medical treatment. And this aspect, we cannot, uh, um, uh, we cannot just ignore in a low resource country like ours. So there are clear cut advantages of medical management, including the preservation of uterus, no loss of fertility, improved quality of life with relief of symptoms, and of course, reduced cost of treatment. Novak's textbook quotes that for women who are mildly or moderately symptomatic with fibroid, watchful waiting may allow treatment to be deferred, perhaps indefinitely. So my opponent's concerns would be definitely regarding the side effect of the medical drugs, the temporary cure, issues of compliance, risk of recurrence, growth of myoma after stopping the drug. But then look at the limitation of myomectomy as well. Here also, we can have the persistence of symptoms, the recurrence of symptom, the need for future surgery because of new fibroid coming up. And don't forget the need of cesarean section in future pregnancy. And of course, there could be risk related to morselation as well. If we look at the limitations of more radical surgery like hysterectomy, this results in complete loss of fertility, loss of uterus, which could mean a loss of amenity to Many women increased cost, undesirable comorbidities in terms of prolonged hospitalization, uh, transfusions, carrying, and other problems. And of course, there is always a risk of anesthesia and risk of surgery, not to mention about the very important life threatening morbidities, uh, uh, life affecting morbidities like urinary tract injuries, which can occur during hysterectomy. And this one study shows that it could be as high as 4.3% even when hysterectomy is done for benign disease like fibroid. So friends, the rationale of treatment for fibroid has to be either it should be a life-saving or it should improve the quality of life in terms of uh, elevation of the symptoms or reversal of the symptom. And hysterectomy is not at all a life-saving surgery for the treatment of fibroid for the obvious reason you can understand they are benign, slow-growing tumors, risk of malignancy absolutely less, and it is almost never associated with mortality. And when we compare the quality of life in terms of improvement of the symptoms, we have good RCTs which suggest that uterine artery embolization has uh, the SF scores regarding quality of life at one year, almost similar to the hysterectomy, and of course, with a faster recovery rate. Then uh, we have two very good randomized control trial regarding two most uh, upcoming promising drug, uh, mifepristone and esoprisnil for the treatment of fibroid in terms of improved quality of life. And friends, the future research is also going to be in the field of medical wonder molecule, which PC sir was looking for when he was advising Priyankur that there should be some mantras uh, so that this fibroid goes off. So we can look for the wonder molecule, which will prevent the occurrence of fibroid in a genetically predisposed myomas. 
Until then, the next best treatment option would be to prevent fibroid from becoming symptomatic and to explore the most minimally invasive treatment options and those wonder molecules to absolutely relieve the symptoms. And we hope to someday see a time when fibroid is no longer a leading cause of hysterectomy. So friends, ultimately, the treatment has to be a balancing act where patient understands the risk and benefits of all treatment and so they are empowered to make an informed and regret-free decision. Thank you. That is all I have to say. And I must thank Pratibhadi for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this wonderful webinar, to be uh, to share the platform with Gynex Talbot, especially PC Mahapatra sir, and all the wonderful chairpersons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arjuna, uh, for that uh, uh, brisk and crisp uh, points about uh, for uh, uh, the, man the medical management of fibroid. I think uh, uh, next we will take the uh, the surgical option uh, views of Nidin. To introduce Dr. Nidin Shah, uh, he is a recipient of Gold Golden Hand Awards, a recipient of Wonder Foxian Award, and world record holder for removing the heaviest uh, fibroid, largest paraovarian cyst, and hysterectomy in male. And uh, uh, as most of you know, he's a wonderful laparoscopy surgeon. And uh, I think he's a very energetic man. I think he will be highlighting and he has got a rich experience of lapros uh, laparoscopy 15 years and with more than 25,000 laparoscopies and uh, uh, publications also, national and international publications. Uh, uh, for, and when, and he has trained a lot of uh, gynecologists in laparoscopy. Over to Nidin for the surgical management of fibroid. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Yeah. So is it in... Is, Easy intubation, but my co, co sir person want nasal intubation, you know. This is how we complicate our thing. Whatever is we can see, we ignore that and we want something new. Why this? Hope is not a good strategy. Our madam told to chant mantra and fibroid will go. Madam, hope is not a good strategy. If hope is a good strategy, my opponent will keep adding one pill, two pill, three pill, four pill, and patient will just eat pills, pills, and pills. Every surgeon should pick up a right surgical technique for a right patient understanding his or her limitation and mastery over the subject. As the experience increases, the exclusion criteria relaxes considerably and one can proceed for more complicated cases. Our own comfort level expands. Every surgery, let it be open or endoscopy, has its own share of complication. The greatest hazard to the patient is not the surgery, but the surgeon himself or herself. Discipline in a surgeon's sound knowledge of anatomy and equipment is very, very important. Now, my opponent, can you treat this fibroid, multiple fibroid? Can this medical management will be effective? Oh my God. Can 26 weeks fibroid can be managed? No. 30 weeks fibroid? No. So can we manage this parasitic fibroid? No. Definitely surgical treatment is here to stay where you can see lots of lots uh, you know, surgical intervention is required and we, when we come to medical line of treatment, it's not going to help the patient in any situation. Now coming to this cystic fibroid, it's a huge 28 week cystic fibroid. Do you think we can manage medically? No, she's a young girl presented with a uh, complex mass and it was denoted as an ovarian malignancy. We put in a scope and it found that it's just a fibroid. You know, so it is easy to manage. We removed and we did in bag morselation. Now, coming to this, this was a case of ectopic pregnancy with seven centimeter broad ligament fibroid, but I'm sure my opponent will deal only with the ectopic pregnancy and put her on later on, on the medical management to reduce the fibroid. But my dear friend, when you already put in a scope, nowadays we are doing caesarean myomectomy, so we can always remove fibroid in the same setting and we can give a better quality of life and better lifestyle and pain, this, reduce dysmenorrhea in a patient with a fibroid. So combination techniques always help. Surgery is a final treatment, what I will say, because it will give permanent cure to the patient. Now, can this be managed surgically, madam? 32 week size fibroid? I don't think so. It is a huge 32 week size fibroid uterus, one can see, and patient has, has to be subjected for the surgical management. You can see it's a huge fibroid. 
so it's not going to be managed with the medical line of treatment this is a 32 weeks torsion para ovarian cyst patient came with the acute pain in abdomen and there was a huge mass you can see uterus and everything is absolutely normal there is a torsion pedicle what you can see there is a torsion round ligament fibroid and i don't think so this can be managed medically and these are the medical emergencies which requires immediate attention and surgical intervention is a must to prevent disaster in the patient so this was a huge round ligament fibroid you can see we just cut the base of the pedicle and then the fibroid was receiving a parasitic blood supply from the adjacent omentum which was taken care of and which you could see now this is our omental parasitic blood vessel so madam has shown us all small small fibroid 2 cm 1 cm 2 cm and was telling that can it does it can it it can be cured with the medical treatment and surgical not required but as a specialist we get all the referred cases where we get a huge huge fibroid where there is a very 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 limited or no role of a medical line of treatment now this is a very interesting case i would like my opponent to treat this intravascular fibroid medically is it not possible so surgery is here to stay surgery is here to benefit all the females suffering from the fibroid and we cannot debate on such topic that medical versus surgical so why surgery is better provide better anatomical views performance of the concomitant procedure such as excision of the endometriotic cyst appendicitis many things we can club together and give a one stay procedure my opponent will invest in land second house bungalows luxury car but my dear you should invest in a surgical luxury like 3d laparoscopy like advanced technology and make the make your patients life more and more comfortable sometimes life is like this picture you have a resources but you make a poor decision versatility of the surgery larger fiber uterus including lower uterine segment broad ligament fibroid and cervical fibroid concurrent ecclesial pathology can be treated evaluation and treatment of pain including endometriosis dense pelvic adhesion and other pelvic pathology can be treated in the same setting even he agrees while doing laparoscopic we can invite our colleagues a general surgeon and do other surgery as well in the same patient i know my, I, i was really uh, prepared that my uh, opponent will bring out this fda warning that uh, you know power morselation is banned but even now agl position statement has come out in 2014 we state that power morselation is here to stay appropriate concern and screening is very important it is then this instrument is not banned and we have a indian where we have made endo bag surgery where we put morselator bag inside and put the entire specimen in the bag and you morselate within the bag and nowadays we are doing this for the all of our patient and we have a zero complication rate zero remnant of the fibroid zero parasitic fibroid and even if there is an occult malignancy it is taken care because of the use of the endo bag so whatever size comes we can manage surgically doing a laparotomy is a victory over complication is not a not a failure of laparoscopy be not afraid of growing slowly be afraid only of standing still what mind doesn't know i cannot see but a laparoscope can see everything statutory warning read fine print carefully my, i will repeat this to my opponent read fine print carefully okay now coming to the evidence based medicine madam give us evidence evidence and evidence i'll give all the evidence again pharmacological agent you read the finer prints and they are available for the short term it is not the treatment it is available for the short term where not suitable for the surgery and it's only pre operative load means this also suggests that surgery is require hence coming to the non hormonal treatment the word may reduce it's highlight the may so you have to read the finer bit may reduce the menorrhagia and pre operative blood loss so this treatment is fail coming to the hormonal treatment it's return it are inconclusive for the fibroids so this treatment is fail levonorgestrel intrauterine system effective for the heavy menstrual bleeding and not the fibroid they are going to treat the symptom but not the cause however there are conflicting results regarding its effects on fibroid and uterine volume and device expulsion at hand this treatment is also fail gonadotropin releasing hormone you have it's clearly mentioned the fda that is used for the pre operative management of the fibroid so surgery is mandatory in this case also so it is not for the treatment of fibroid it is a pre operative management selective progesterone receptor modulator mifepristone 
this study says there, there is no consensus about the effect of mefepristone on fibroid volume it is only symptomatic release in the heavy menstrual blood flow is so this treatment is also failed selective estrogen receptor modulator the trial is such it is an inconsistent trial results regarding relief of symptoms and decrease in fibroid and was limited evidence for the use of this molecule hence this treatment is also failed coming to the uterine artery embolization there is a high rate of minor complication like premature ovarian failure miss embolization high rate for the need for the further intervention is also required in patient undergoing uterine artery embolization there are fewer complication further intervention required almost 23% of the women hence this treatment is also fail high intensity focus ultrasound this was launched with a very high fi and but it also needs a future a uh, research and this treatment is also failed because patients have lost of cramps necrosis fever and it can treat only very very small fibroid which does not require treatment and this treatment is also failed surgical treatment of the fibroid required in women with severe pressure symptoms large perinuclear fibroid sub serous and sub mucosal fibroid and hence my dear friend laparoscopic myomectomy or hysteroscopic myomectomy are here to stay to give a definitive treatment and final result so hysterectomy is a definitive surgical intervention for the women who has already finished so, uh, child bearing and have completed the family and beyond 45 years of age if the fibroids are small so this treatment is passed approved and best service so with this i'll stop we will like to give freedom from fibroid to all of us women suffering from the fibroid and not just to a pill thank you well thank you dr nitin it was uh, looking like the uh, ipl match of uh, royal challengers bangalore we are blasting one hour, <laughs> one on top of the other uh, it was a very wonderful presentation uh, i think by the end of your talk i think the speakers now the people audience who are listening will still be confused whether to go in for medical or whether to go in for surgical although now i think it's a time for rebuttal uh sir uh, can you just uh, no, 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 no. i have given evidence wise all treatment are failed whatever madam has given i have already stamped it is failed <laughs> uh, dr nitin it's uh, whatever mm. evidence you have given you just highlighted on the few side effects part of and you'd never concentrated on the effect in quality uh, of life improvement the reduction of symptoms the reduction in fibroid volume and of course i did agree in my presentation that of course it uh, medical management has a role in some cases surgical management has a role in another case and ultimately it has to be a balanced act size always does not matter as long as it is asymptomatic and it is patient this if she doesn't want to operate i just can't force surgery on her but in that case medicine is also not required in asymptomatic patient medicine is also not required yeah of course i do i did mention about watchful waiting can uh, can be helpful in so many cases and uh, it's a debate so now you you give a rebuttal of two one two minutes and then we will have an audience poll we know the different indication everything but this is just for a debate within you have anything to tell me yes rebuttal yeah yeah i told already i have given evidence all whatever madam has promoted i have already failed stamped that this treatment is not required so any symptomatic patient with fibroid will require a treatment submucous fibroid nowadays we manage in the office setting without anesthesia with a smaller hysteroscope we can give a better treatment why to subject patient to take medicine long and long and long and they will again come with the symptoms so this is one step procedure so i think we all know that there are different we are not going about the size different indication all those things but just for a uh, debate uh, and for an audience uh, poll what will you do if a patient with fibroid comes just as a whole not about the different about size and all we will have an audience poll diksha can you do that yeah thank you sir so uh, i request uh, the support team to show the audience poll yeah actually sir the question for the audience poll is that what will be your preferred method for managing a single fibroid of 5 to 6 cm 
which has been diagnosed accidentally with no complaints in a fertile female so it's a very uh, you know a, a very uh, uh, inclusive uh, scenario which is a woman who has a single fibroid with no complaints and who is fertile as well so we already have had uh, 18 people who have responded and another 30 seconds to go for the poll so let's see if dr arshna ma'am has managed to sway people or dr nitin has managed or actually we do not need any treatment at all and as the poll is going on i would like to uh, really thank my speakers i think uh, we were in a tussle as to who we would side with and both of them had us convinced that medical or surgical management uh, would be really apt in particular situations and there is no single way forward but we have to be very individualized depending on how the patient presents i think we can uh, we have few more seconds to go yeah so uh, we have the results now and uh, uh, we had 32 people who we had yeah about 32 people who voted and uh, 50% people voted for no treatment 47% voted for medical management in this scenario and 3% felt that surgical management was the way forward So we chair persons one, not the doctor. We need to chair. repeat this webinar. People have not understood Mahapatra sir's picture. <laughs> Mahapatra sir always uh, favored medical treatment in certain circumstances and surgery in certain circumstances. He never opted for a single treatment which you suggest surgery yeah. in all cases. Uh, He never opted for that. Definitely. Yeah. Madam, for this wonderful opportunity, it was a fun debating, madam. You are yeah. quite senior and same here, same yeah. here. I am meeting you for the first time. It was nice debating with you. And he's a very good laparoscopic surgeon. I know. I can see yeah. from his videos. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, dear speakers. And I would like uh, Fessy sir to just uh, sum up this session now, and uh, which is the last session for today. And then Pratibha ma'am uh, for the vote of thanks. I think uh, after hearing from uh, uh, P. C. Mahathir Mahapatra sir, Dr. Nidhi was chatting, was telling almost everything is uh, covered by sir, and so meticulously different instances, different uh, clinical scene, everything has been covered, and excellent uh, surgical techniques was shown by Dr. Nidhi, and uh, sum up of the medical management was given by Dr. Archana. I think this was indeed the almost said. Uh, Uh, as a revision of uh, as a fibroid for all the gynecologists who are attended, those who are not attended, I think they have missed this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I think, and I, I uh, along with the, the Prasad, Agwinder Prasad, the thanks, uh, thanking the Dr. Pradipa for giving this uh, opportunity, and Dr. Priyanka and Diksha for uh, more, uh, moderating this uh, wonderful uh, uh, webinar CME. Uh, thank you all, Prasad. thank you so much uh, and uh, you know it was a welcome respite uh, from all the negativity around us and the most positive out of this pandemic has been that from the comfort of our homes we can uh, witness our mentors our experts and our pioneers in the field and as sir said uh, dr pratibha ma'am had such a innovative idea to have focus cmes and webinars so thank you ma'am for this opportunity and thank you all our speakers and i invite ma'am to present the vote of thanks for everyone thank you diksha so once again i would like to thank all our viewers for being there and i am really indebted to dr hema divakar ma'am for accepting our invitation and gracing this occasion and also sharing her valuable inputs and my sincere gratitude to dr bhasar mukherjee and dr abha singh for being there and sharing their experiences and from the bottom of my heart i want to thank dr pc mahapatra sir for such wonderfully involving us in this his talk and it was so engrossing and inform informative thank you so much sir i would also like to thank dr gopinath sir dr nishi dr raghavendra prasad dr fasil luis for making the session so interactive 
and my many many thanks goes to our debaters young debaters dr archana and dr nitin for making debate so interesting and thought provoking and finally my sincere thanks goes to dr priyankur and dr diksha for smooth coordination thank you so much and today my special thanks especially goes to shield connect for supporting this program in spite of so many odds many of their executives are uh, suffering from covid but spite of that we were holding we are holding this webinar and that, that and that shows their commitment so thank you so much thank you saurabh chitralekha and stalin for this uh, supporting us from background and again i would like to say that please stay safe take all precautions and try to be on the safer side because this covid is not leaving anybody so we will meet again and our next webinar will be on 20th of may again on a very interesting topic with great faculty so till then stay safe and healthy and good bye and thank you so thank much you good night thank you. thank you all thank you everyone thank you everyone thank you diksha